Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Breaking in the Olympic Speaker Series. I'm Jason Ng, a b-boy musician and postdoctoral fellow at Cypher Project University Co uh, College Cork in Ireland. Um, today I'm hosting with co-organizer Mary Fogarty, a b-girl and professor of dance at York University in Toronto, Canada. Um, big thanks and shout out to Hannah George Wheeler for helping us behind the scenes, uh, monitoring the chat, making sure everything runs smoothly today. Uh, Mary, I might hand it over to you to introduce uh, our guests and, and sort of the rationale for new people. Yeah, this sounds great. Um, so this speaker series is a platform for researchers studying the important cultural moment of breaking at the Paris Olympics in 2024. The series was intended to open up a conversation between researchers, practitioners, and the general public to share knowledge. And the speaker series is an opportunity for everyone to present research in progress. The presenters, uh, most of the presenters submitted abstracts to be part of a special issue on breaking in the Olympics for the journal Global Hip Hop Studies to be published in 2023. Uh, many of the presenters are in the early days of their research. Um, and this is really a practice space for ideas. It's no one's final say on their work. A lot of people are starting research projects, so we're all here to share and there's no, there's no kind of final word. Even the publication, you know, there'll be further research after that because it'll come out before the Olympics. So we're just, this is all work in progress. Before we move on, we'd like to first shout out and thank Adam Hopped and Griff Rolfesson uh, for giving us a space to explore this critical moment in the special issue of Global Hip Hop Studies and to the Cypher Project for their support of the speaker series. In today's session, we'll be hearing from a range of new research directions. And our first presenter, unfortunately, couldn't be here uh, with us live because he's in flight at the moment. Um, but Dr. Paul Sadat is a dance theater practitioner, a practice researcher, and a visiting research fellow at the Center for the Interdisciplinary Performative Arts, Royal Birmingham Conservato Conservatory, UK. He's a capoeira professor and works internationally as a movement director and choreographer. And his brilliant doctoral research developed the concept, brilliant was my <laughs> editorializing of his bio. <laughs> his brilliant doctoral research developed the concept of a metaspatial knowledge as a necessary element in UK hip hop dance theater and as a means of resisting choreo policing. Paul has contributed a chapter to the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Hip Hop Dance Studies, also brilliant in my opinion. Um, and. Uh, Unfortunately, he can be with us today, but hopefully he'll be at future sessions and we'll at least have time to have a conversation about his work later on in the in the um, the conversation today. There's a desire to reach out to the younger people and to try and get people invested in, hooked on and indoctrinated by the Olympic Games at a young age. The IOC's interest in these so-called youth action sports, many practitioners of these activities bristle at having them described as sports, raises certain questions. Who or what gets to speak for a sport and a community? And what does it mean to bring these disciplines and their attendant cultures to the Olympic stage? Right now, there are near existential battles over who exerts control over the youth action sports once they are adopted or appropriated, as some might argue, by the Olympics. The Olympic Games have been foisted on the French people as they have been foisted on all previous populations without their consent. They have been sold to them using spurious arguments or rather slogans masquerading as arguments. In the name of building green facilities, millions and millions of tonnes of concrete will be poured, costing untold quantities of energy. But it is the lies told about the social effects of the Games that are the most revolting. Some of the events and much of the building will take place in Saint-Denis, the poorest and most overcrowded part of the city. Taking the London Olympics as an example, where precisely the same lies were told, it is clear that the local population, relatively impoverished and unqualified, will benefit not at all and may even be pushed out by development. Uh, hello, my name's Paul Sado, Dr. Paul Sado. Um, I'm a visiting research fellow at the Centre for Inter Interdisciplinary Performative Arts, which is a mouthful in itself. Uh, firstly, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, digitally in person, I guess, um, uh, because I've got to travel. Um, a little bit about my background, um, although you can find it at, uh, on my website, which is paulsadot.com. 
Um, I've got a background in dance theatre. Um, I've done capoeira for 35 years. Um, I choreographed the 2002 Commonwealth Games, um, which had um, four stages, uh, one including um, B-boys and B-girls, the other capoeira, bangra, and so-called street dance. Um, I've been through those experiences of working with large organisations on big events. Um, I also ran Dance Offensive um, in Cambridge for nine years, which worked with young offenders and young people, developing um, engagement and, and prospects through um, through dance, which was um, including breaking capoeira and, and um, other forms. And we performed at Breaking Convention on several occasions with um, dance theatre pieces. I also wrote um, uh, a thesis um, that inquires about the relationship between hip hop dance theatre and the spaces that artists move in in the UK, spaces that are governed by socio, historical, political, and other forces, which I, I termed the meta space, and um, it calls for the development of, of meta spatial knowledge um, among artists. And um, particularly, I was working with an enclave of um, of, of dancers, which included Joshua Nash um, and um, Jordan Douglas uh, from Botus Severs um, Far From The Norm. So we worked together over five years um, looking at what was going on um, politically in the way that they're um, coerced and encouraged to move. And I, I was using a lens called choreo politics and choreo policing. And it's possible to look at um, how aspects of an artist's life or of a dancer's life, um, such as funding, uh, mentorships, uh, um, access, how these are all uh, um, driven towards encouraging people to move in a certain way, particularly in the UK, which, um, as Bell Hooks noted uh, a very long time ago, that we tend to only value um, things that mimic the white Western artistic continuum. And that's certainly true of, of the British Arts Council and other funders here. So I'm taking this lens um, that I've been developing now for um, eight, nine years of choreo policing and examining the movements of the Olympics. And uh, I only have 20 minutes. So what, what I want to do is just present some provocations. My, my um, doctoral thesis used um, the, the UK Olympics as a prime example of how the Olympics, which is uh, it's actually, actually a, a, a documented and researched fact that it's the biggest cause of eviction in the world and that it displaces a lot of people. And still in the U instance of the UK, Newham was cleared for um, the Olympic Stadium and, uh, and affordable housing was promised and uh, none of it has manifested. What has manifested is um, are some um, penthouse blocks where the cheapest uh, penthouse is £400,000. One of the things I always say is gentrifying city, gentrifying arts, and there's a certain politic that goes along with that concept. And it is... Um, very much enforced on every level, including um, in the UK for sure, the negotiations between the Sports Council, the Arts Council, the, their, um, the Television Council, they're all linked in their agenda. That's not, um, that's not a theory, that's a fact. So uh, I'm going to share some of the um, notions about the Olympics that um, highlight it as something problematic for the communities that host it and uh, and and kind of um, imply that it's a spectacle um, that I would put under um, celebration capitalism um, that's designed to um, to coerce and to distract while a lot of other things um, go on like um, social cleansing, um, greenwashing art washing, uh, um, displacement of peoples. So there's these many contradictions and uh, metaspatial knowledge is something I encourage artists to um, take part in, to be aware of the conversation rather than to be uh, uh, um, non-skeptical. Skepticism for me is a, um, a, an inquiry and uh, there, there are many problematic questions uh, raised by the area in which the Paris Olympics are taking, Saint-Denis. Uh, and also some of the things that are happening, including greenwashing, which is the pretense that this is the greenest Olympics ever. Um, but breaking is something that they need. They need to um, 
to create a new audience. And uh, we need to be aware of all these things and to openly discuss them and to engage in critique uh, um, around this subject so that we are the ones who hold the knowledge, the metaspatial knowledge that we can apply to the space where the actual movement and movements of um, breaking take place. Um, I hope that makes sense. I have no script. I'm just uh, doing this uh, um, in, a, in a moment that I've got between, between traveling. So um, I hope you find this um, interesting and I hope to meet you all at a later date. Presently, the title of my um, paper is Breaking Up Communities, um, the Olympic Movements or How the Olympics Move People, because there are, um, it's kind of an interactive term. They do those. Uh, those tunes and it's quite a complex interaction. Uh, trying to move the page on. So movement is a political action. Um, uh, um, it's for me impossible to to deny this fact um, that movement is a political action. And uh, metaspatial knowledge, which is a term um, I created during earlier research, denotes critical thinking about the wider space in which breaking circulates, a multi-dimensional space filled with its own histories, imbued with cultural imperatives, political agendas and the ghosts of movements past. This is essentially knowledge of the wider socio-cultural, historical, economic and political space in which dance artists move, a space where multiple components such as funding, artistic supervision, gentrification and culturification come together to impose a form of institutionally driven choreo-policing. Choreo-policing being a term that Lepecki um, created in um, 2013. The term choreo policing was developed by experimental dramaturg and scholar Andre Lepecki, and in the context of my research, denotes complex and interrelated structures of supervision, the purpose of which is to enforce a pre choreographed pattern of circulation, corporeality, and belonging. And the Olympics certainly falls into that category. Um, one of the uh, books I'm reading recently uh, uh, argues that the, the, there's a, an effort to uh, Olympianize the world to make it this one um, big product that, that um, pursues a certain agenda. The politics of movement. I argue that people are allowed to move and how, why, where and when this occurs is defined by a complex meta space that is driven by financialization, primarily I would say now, and the dialogue between cultural, social and financial capital. So. Um, Bourdieu deals with this and we can certainly apply it to the life of um, an artist and at the moment the cultural social and financial capital of b-boys and b-girls it uh, is at its peak um, given events of the last two years and the need for um, and I don't like this this word but, but, but urban images to uh, to appear uh, within the benign embrace of the Olympics um, so that we truly feel that they care about the areas in which the Olympics takes place. It's possible to examine movement through the lens of choreo policing and choreo politics, and that's the lens I use for my research. Um, the spectacle, argues Marxist theorist and writer Guy Debord, encapsulates the absolute socio-economic governance of that particular society, and consequently we are compelled to engage with its processes and agendas, and that um, quote has never been truer than now for me and um, particularly in the case of, of the Olympics and um, what it's trying to achieve within the kind of capitalist uh, model. The Olympics has um, a violent history and uh, you, you can access it if, if, you, um, if you look for this. Um, Barrington um, says that the Olympics represent a huge exercise in procurement and construction two classic areas for corruption to flourish. And you can look at any of the past Olympics and find uh, well-documented corruption, particularly within the IOC, but lots of um, uh, um, deals that go on with builders and security firms and suppliers and this whole uh, um, gamut of, of, um, of support mechanisms that move with the Olympics, all these vast contracting networks that, um, that go with it. Some host governments have used Olympic preparations as an excuse to rid themselves of inconvenient domestic elements, whether it was Mexico massacring student protesters to prevent unrest from spoiling the 1968 Summer Games, or South Korea rounding up and interning thousands of homeless people in Seoul, lest they damage the country's image during the 1988 Summer Games. 
If the Olympics have not and cannot achieve their lofty aims, then exactly what special purpose does this quadrennial exercise in corporate and governmental gigantism serve other than to, other than to enrich well-connected businesses and aggrandize states? And that is a fantastic question that I wanted to discuss had I um, been there today. And uh, that's um, a very important question that we need to ask um, when taking part in these things. There has been a very determined effort to effectively socially cleanse the Olympic city of the homeless, drug addicts or vagrants. And uh, this happens to every host city. I mean, I spent a lot of time in Brazil and when the Olympics were held there, I was in dialogue with a lot of the caparistas there. And that certainly um, happened. And um, there's a dark history behind the glittering Olympic Games is a fantastic um, read by Simon Worrell. Any reading of Olympic history reveals the true motives of each host city. It is the necessity to shock. Um, you can even look at Naomi Klein's shock doctrine to, to see what that is. And of course, Milton Friedman talked about the um, need to shock to um, support the kind of neoliberal model that takes advantages of, of those situations. Uh, it is the necessity to shock, to fast track the dispossession of the poor and marginalised as part of the larger machinations of capital accumulation. The architects of, it, of this plan need a spectacular show, a hegemonic device to rec reconfigure the rights, spatial relations and self-determination of the city's working class, to reconstitute for whom and for what purpose the city exists. Unlike any other event, the Olympics provide just that kind of opportunity. And that's from a fantastic article by Kumar, um, entitled want to cleanse your city of its poor host the olympics and um, it is that idea of celebration capitalism which always goes in hand in hand i would argue with disaster capitalism uh, a good uh, example of disaster capitalism will be to examine what's happened over the two the last two years with uh, with covid which i've also been researching and the vast amount of money that was made um uh, during and is still being made during this um these movements or movements of people or, or how we move during this period, um, interesting times. Celebration capitalism, what is it? Um, celebration capitalism is a theory that examines the manipulation of state actors as partners that drives us towards public private partnerships in which the public pays and the private profits. Boykoff argues that the Athens games in 2004 marked, quote, the full emergence of celebration capitalism with London 2012 representing its quintessential expression, characterized by a state of exception, unfettered commercialism, repression of dissent, questionable sustainability claims, and the complicity of the mainstream media. And I would agree with all of that because I closely examined the 2012 games and you can see that the so-called um, promised public access and affordable housing has not materialized. What we have now is a series of gatekeepers taking their place within, um, the city of London that's geared totally towards um, um, cultural tourism, if one reads the, um, the Arts Council incentives for, for um, funding. Former IOC marketing head Michael Payne once approvingly branded the Games the world's longest commercial. And um, I heard some of the other presenters of this series recently talking about how they were trying to raise money for training referees or adjudicators to to decide um, who is the best breaker or, or, or what, what, whatever the framework is I'm not quite sure and I was shocked that they that they weren't aware of the or seemed unaware of the billions of pounds that are spent and the profits that are made on the games and um, and that they should have to raise funding to provide one of the um, spectacles that the games most needs, which is the um, the idea of youth and um, urban games that they've been trying to develop over a period of time, and the social, uh, cultural, and financial capital of breaking at the moment via other events that that, that have spread worldwide. I guess things like the Red Bull and, uh, and events like that make it a, a, a highly profitable spectacle that the IOC will capitalise on, and their their um, members and supporters who are, who are part of that um, financial network. Yet it's really surprising to see that the breakers are having to fund themselves for various um, efforts. And, and, and I would um, 
find this really problematic and something to be debated uh, um, in depth because there are ways of, of securing the funding once you realize your own um, capital status. Shiny promises of Olympic legacies, legacies that sports historian J.A. Mangan calls a promiscuous assemblage of hope. And the Olympic Games always sells that idea of hope, legacy. There was a kind of irony in the British Olympics where um, Danny Boyle was hosting um, a kind of retrospective homage to uh, the industrial era in Britain, uh, when in reality, the industrial era for the working classes was one of the most terrible, violent periods in British history. You know, there we were. Um, I didn't watch the opening ceremony. I, I, I watched glimpses of it. It was being celebrated as one of the great achievements, the Industrial Revolution. But um, behind the Industrial Revolution was a lot of um, oppression and violence. The phenomenon we're going to describe in terms of its most salient but often almost invisible characteristics pertains more importantly to a colonization of the body in many of those who devote themselves to it relentlessly and a mutilation of awareness in all those mesmerized by its spectacle. Fantastic quote um, from Perelman in Barbaric Sport, A Global Plague, and one that I think could be unpicked in relation to um, B-boys and B-girls taking part and what they actually give in return for, um, for taking part. Social cleansing and gentrification or regeneration as they like to brand it. Architecture and urban renewal are not neutral endeavors independent of the social context. They are decreed and conceived in the repositories of political and of course economic executive power and they embody aesthetic, sociological, scientific and technological standards. Again, um, this is me thinking about um, Saint Denis, where they're um, intending to, to um, host these events and, um, and the community that already live there, which are very reminiscent of the community that lived in Newham that got totally uh, uh, relocated uh, uh, away from their um, geographic home. The goal of the Olympic Charter is to Olympianize the planet the Olympic Charter projects an illusion, the idea of a moment of fraternity, the iconic dominion of fair play in a more general mission of peace for the duration of the games. When in reality, the usual massacres, terror, crime and torture continued unabated in most of the world's countries, sometimes even than the one hosting the games, as with China in 2008. This is very true. Uh, uh, um, and uh, again, something really worth um, considering. Uh, and um, debating. Sport is imperialist. So this is from Barbaric Sport, a global plague, which just doesn't, uh, which doesn't just deal with the Olympics, but deals with the uh, idea of, uh, uh, of mega sport, I like to call it. Sport is imperialist, not only because it colonizes land and destroys people's cultures, but also because of the disappearance of ancient popular practices in favor of a handful of globalized and globalizing sporting disciplines, such as football, the sports empire is settling down as a mobile tournament ground, a turntable of exchanges, all organized as a social project adjusted to the world, but breaking down its historical diversity to accommodate a homogenizing globalized sport. You could even say that sport has become the mode or model of the current globalization, not just its reflection, but its true blueprint. That's some of the provocations I'd like to um, leave you with today. And again, I apologize for not being there and I hope that they might provide some useful points of um, discussion. Um, thank you very much and I uh, hope to see you soon. Bye -bye. Great, well I look forward to discussing Paul's work with all of you um, after the next two presentations. Um, it's really great to see everyone here. We have a serious cast of people in the room. So um, if everyone stays to the end, we, we are hoping to have a big discussion um, about Paul's work and how it relates to the other work today. As we switch gears to the next presenter, I would also like to share in the chat the work of Ainsley Jones. For those that want a great resource on B-Girls from the 1970s onwards, it's a huge contribution to the field. Ainsley Jones is here in the room today, which we're blessed with and Jones published this work over 10 years ago, and it will give historical context for those 
researchers and maybe people outside the scene that want some sense of the contributions of B-girls um, and also a really great analysis of what it means for dance studies. So I've just thrown that in the chat for future research for people. Our next presentation is from Emma Reddy. During her 23 years of breaking, Emma Reddy has established an international reputation as an inspirational, empathetic, empathetic motivator who is both approachable and accessible. Her students describe her as a treasure trove of information, and she's known for her clear, helpful, and insightful approach to sharing knowledge. Emma's leadership style has been described as inspirational and elevating. She's renowned for her creativity and has been dubbed 10,000 Moves Master. Her recent choreographic work looks at the issue of coercive control and has been described as, quote, utterly, awfully wonderful, end quote, and also hauntingly beautiful. And if I can just add a word of my own, um, I think Emma Reddy's dancing is profound. Um, she's also one of the funniest people I know. <laughs> um, it makes me, makes me laugh, um, has added so much to the hip hop community internationally through her ongoing presence. So I'm very excited to introduce Emma Reddy. Oh, thank you, Mary. It was a, a nice addition. Can I add that into my bio, please? Absolutely. <laughs> Cool. Right, we'll just get my uh, thing up. Okay. So let's go back to the beginning. So my name's Emma, and what I'm going to be talking about is protection of Olympic breakers from sexual harassment and assault. So uh, what I've been looking at is, first of all, the Olympic Charter. So um, one of those... Uh, fundamental premises that they have is that the practice of sport is a human right um, so everyone should be free to practice sport without discrimination um, and in the and then the olympic spirit okay so this the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms should be secured without discrimination of any kinds so that includes uh, race color sex sexual orientation language religion political or other opinion national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Okay, so then on the IOC website, um, so they're partnered with Safe Sport. Um, so they go on to define what sexual abuse is, um, saying it's a behavior towards an individual or group that involves sexualized verbal, nonverbal or physical behavior, <clears throat> whether intended or unintended legal or illegal that is based upon an abuse of power and trust okay so this is all important stuff thinking about um in terms of breaking like who are the coaches who are the judges who are those people in positions of power and who automatically are awarded trust because they're in those positions okay also involves any sexual activity where consent is not or cannot be given and what i want to talk about is this process of grooming. So we'll get into that. Uh, so this is still from the IOC website. So talks about how an abuser targets their victims. So they look out for vulnerabilities and find occasions to test out um, if they can uh, exploit those vulnerabilities um, and see if they're susceptible to, to any kind of abuse. But still, while striking up a friendship and being nice, it's a very covert um, action. Um, and then they go on to build trust and friendship. Uh, so making them feel special is something you know that's easy to do if you're if you're training breakers. So breakers who want to be Olympians want to be the best. You know they want to be the best that they can be, and they want to win. So making someone who's training to compete in the Olympics feel special can be really easy for someone in that position of trust and who has power over you. Um, spending time together, there will be a lot of that when you're training, you're being coached. Um, so basically it's striking up a friendship and making that person trust the abuser. <clears throat> but then once that trust is developed, then um, they can isolate. So this talks about children, but applies to adults as well. So they can isolate um, the, the person they're victimizing. So cut them off from any uh, outside support. So that could be friends, 
maybe a crew, maybe your crew members are not in the Olympics, so they're kind of telling you, oh, don't train with them anymore. You're with us now, so kind of leave that behind. Um, this one, so being inconsistent, so you can make someone, make them feel special, but then turn around and be like, well, actually, you didn't do very well today, so you can crush their hopes just as easily as you can build them up. And that's all testing as well. Um, and then secrecy, making, invoking guilt. So saying, I've done this for you, now you have to do this for me. And the discrediting the victim, saying, if you tell anyone what's happening, no one will believe you because I'm in the position of power and people trust me and you're just who you are. You're not as important as me. Okay, but then it, what it doesn't talk about is something that I'm going to talk about here. So this, this is a report by um, uh, a guy that was in the FBI, an FBI agent who works in the child sexual abuse team. So he did a, an investigation into Sandusky, who was a, a coach for American football at Penn State University. So this is a, like 2013, but what's in this report is important here because he talks about... Um, uh, so grooming is a pattern of activity employed to gain access, authority and control for sexual purposes, to ensure their silence and to keep them in a position in which they can be repeatedly victimised. OK, so this is also relevant. This could happen to breakers in this kind of Olympic environment. But what's what's important and what's not on the IOC website is this part here. So. This process aimed at, is aimed at potential victims, but also their parents or guardians and the community that surrounds them. So it's not just the victim that the abuser is trying to, to groom, it's everyone, it's the whole community, um, so that they can be seen as a nice guy or, or a nice, nice woman. So this is someone uh, who can fool everyone around them into believing that they are trustworthy, they're nice, they're helpful, they're looking out for um, in the best interests of all the, the athletes and all the while they're behind closed doors abusing. Um, so this could be difficult to prove because nobody wants to believe that this nice guy or this nice woman is an abuser. Um, so it sets, gives them even more trust and not just in the between the victim and the abuser but in the whole community. Um, which is something that I think we've seen come out in the past couple of years in the hip hop dance scene, um, as we've had our Me Too moment. Okay, and back to the IOC, so it talks about gender harassment. So that's unwanted behavior related to someone's gender that offends that person's personal dignity. Okay, so just uh, to separate the abuse from the harassment and what's also relevant is the homophobia. Okay, because um, so male victims of sexual abuse and harassment are don't want to come forward, and this is one of the fears is 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 homophobia is that oh maybe they'll think I'm gay if they're not gay, um because they've been abused if they're a man or a boy and they've been abused by a man. So this can be if there is a culture of homophobia, um, in, in the training sessions or in the whole Olympic culture in the whole breaking scene then this just helps abusers get away with what they're getting away with. <clears throat> so on the IOC website, it says, what can you do? What can athletes do to protect themselves? Uh, so here, this is interesting. So follow their organization's procedures if there are any. So what if there aren't any? Uh, know your rights and responsibilities. But again, if there's no procedures in your organization, how do you know or how do you find out what your rights and responsibilities are? And the same here, know what to do to prevent and report concerns. But how are you supposed to know how to report, who to report to, or how to do anything preventative if there's nothing set down to, to educate anyone on that? So next we're going to look at this. So now we're on to the World Dance Sport Federation, uh, their code of ethics. So there's all that stuff on the IOC website, but this is what I could find on the WDSF website here, respectfulness, 
So it just says physical, mental, emotional, professional, sexual, and other all other forms of harassment or injury of or by any person in dance sport are prohibited. So that seems to be all they've got written down about sexual abuse and harassment on the website. So now we're going to talk about Larry Nasser. So a more recent uh, Olympic sexual abuse scandal. So Larry Nasser was, um, well, he's a convicted sex offender, but he's a former USA gymnastics doctor who for almost three decades committed thousands of sexual assaults on athletes, young athletes and young adult athletes. So this report looks at how, how he got away with it for so long. So we can look at this and see what we can learn to help our breakers in the Olympic scene. So first thing they talk about is the grooming. So I think it's important that um, we, not just in the Olympics, but in general, understand what grooming is and how to spot it. Uh, so he, so we're going back to the nice guy offender. So he groomed the survivors and their families and the coaches, the administrators, the officials into believing that he was an advocate for the athletes and a, a doctor who deeply cared about his patients, um, not just their physical well-being, but their mental and emotional health. And they made <clears throat> the, the victims feel like he was their friend, um, all the while committing these heinous acts. So the report also found that he acted within an ecosystem that facilitated his abuse. So lots of victims reported him, but they weren't believed. So individuals with and these institutions didn't believe what the athletes were saying, so didn't go on to report him to who they were supposed to report him to and take it to the next level. So he continued to get away with it. Um, and also the institutions failed to stop him as well. So they just ignored the red flags, didn't recognise the grooming behaviours and didn't listen to the athletes. So this is something... Even, so even though USA Gymnastics did have regulations and policies and procedures in place, they weren't followed. So they didn't have a culture surrounding the gymnastics community of this won't be condoned if it's happening to you, here's what you do, we'll help you. That was all gone, it was just all about winning medals. Yeah, so the athletes who did come forward, they were shunned, shamed or disbelieved by others in their own communities. So that can happen when people don't understand the dynamics of abuse, which is why it's important that we understand <clears throat> what those dynamics are. Um, so, uh, okay, next. So, and they had a complaint, they did have a complaint procedure which I'm going to talk about with the WDSF in a sec, but they, it was difficult to navigate, poorly tailored, tailored to allegations of sexual abuse specifically, and it didn't have any protections against retaliation for the athletes who were shunned, shamed, and dismissed. Um, so that's something that needs to be included in any policies that we have. So here in the WDSF, if you make a complaint um, first of all, you have to be a member of the WDSF to make a complaint. So if you suspect something is going on within your local WDSF, but you're not a member, you would have to become a member to complain, it seems to be. But there's this bit here that says, in cases in which a governing document of WDSF specifically provides that a particular kind of decision of the WDSF disciplinary council or general meeting is final, Members and recognised continental associations waive the right to take such dispute to any other court or tribunal. So that sounds like it's saying you can only report to the WDSF and you can't take it to your local police station. It sounds like to me. Maybe I'm wrong. That's how I'm reading that, which seems against uh, our human rights. So I think that needs to be questioned. <clears throat> so this is a great article that has looked into... Uh, this Larry Nasser case, this came out last year um, <clears throat> by Anne-Marie Burke and she's made a lot of, or five recommendations for the IOC that are very relevant. So this was last year, so they've not been implemented yet. Um, so 
these recommendations are could equally be applied to the WDSF at the moment before we get to 2024 to give our breakers some protection. So I'll just say the first recommendation is, so the IOC is at the top of all the governing structures. So they have power over all the international federations, athletes, coaches, everything. So they need to start and others can follow their lead. They need to be a leader in this area. So if the, the main WDSF, which has, you know, different uh, uh, associations in different countries and continents, if they start and say, if you want to be a member of the WDSF, you have to abide by our rules, regulations and policies about sexual abuse and harassment, which at the moment they don't seem to be doing. Um, there are some, like the USA, Canada and New Zealand are affiliated with Safe Sport, which have these documents, but not all of them are. So I think that should be a, a prerequisite for joining. Uh, so the current policies in the IOC are too vague. They don't specifically talk about sexual harassment and abuse, which is the same with the WDSF. They've just got that one little sentence. So there needs to be more specific. Um, the IOC should implement mandatory education and training. So for anyone involved, <clears throat> so for athletes, coaches, adjudicators, everyone, that should also be the case with the WDSF. Um, and this one, last one, to have a global center modeled after the US Center for Safe Sport. And the US Center for Safe Sport was created after the Larry Nasser um, scandal. So that's them, you know, trying to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And if it does, that it's treated better and it's resolved more quickly uh, than, you know, over three decades. <clears throat> so there's lots missing and lots that needs to be done. How would I do a stop share? So that's what I found so far. That's what I'm up to. Um, I've got lots more reading to do, but so far it seems like there's a lot of recommendations that need to be made. And uh, if the IOC aren't going to do it before 2024, maybe as a community, we need to speak to the WDSF and see what we can do on our level. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Anna. And um, we have time to take any one or two kind of pressing questions. We'll come back to this again in the discussion later, but does anyone have any um, questions for Emma or comments? It's a lot to think about and process, and I know Devorah will have some, some kind of insights um, as well in a bit. Um, so let's, we'll keep it moving. Um, for now and come back unless unless I've missed someone hang on I'll check in the chat I'm just I, I just have a question regarding you know the procedures and all these things that are supposed to be in place who who is doing that for the breakers who is where are we coming up with this like how is that being formed how's that being looked at like, well, like I you think, said, um, sorry, yeah go when you go um so like I said, the USA, Canada, and New Zealand uh, dance sport, which are the, the local or countrywide uh, associations of WDSF, are with safe sports. So they'll be working with safe sports to get all those documents ready. Um, but the ones that aren't partnered, I don't know what they're doing. That's something that needs to be found out. Mm. Okay. That was a great I, presentation. Thank yeah, you. I know for Canada, Raul, just because we're in Canada, that um, yeah. the Canada dance sport, like a lot of other sport organizations, organizations, they all pay one um, body that's uh, an organization outside of those individual sports. They all pay one company to look at complaints. So the at least for Canada, the breaking will go through Canada dance sport, and there's a complaint process that involves again a second. Um, organization. But as Emma says, some countries don't have that kind of structure set up as well. And the other and, thing is it only protects people that are part of members um, mm -hmm. of the system. So in other words, in our community, if they're not a member, they're also not um, protected in the same way of that, pro at least in terms of the process of complaints. 
And I guess it's kind of a comment um, because we both watched um, the gymnastic documentary, um, which was, I think it's on Netflix maybe, um, but I can't remember his name, but the man who um, abused women uh, for 30 years. But it, it was quite clear in that process that even when you make a complaint, when someone's in a, um, a system where they've kind of got everyone on their side, like they're working for free, they're doing favors for people, nobody really wants to believe. And so it seems like even when there's a complaint system in place, there can be problems as Emma's kind of bringing up. So I'm gonna throw um, mm -hmm. a, a academic author in the chat there, Ahmed, who just has a new book out on complaints. She's looking at academic institutions, but thinking through what happens when someone complains and how do they, they get labeled as the problem and the troublemaker. Uh, Emma, do you wanna say a bit about that? And I guess my question is about our, our scene, the hip hop community, which is kind of unregulated mm -hmm. besides people um, going to local authorities and police and saying someone's abused me. Mm -hmm. We don't have any kind of regulations within the scene versus this model of complaints. Uh, do you have any thoughts on mm -hmm. the, how that's going to work with a scene that's um, unregulated? And, yeah, so I, yeah, so what this is also relevant to the question that Charles has asked in the chat about uh, what would effective training look like? Uh, so many of these trainings and institutions seem like formalities. So I think what needs to happen is that, well, in the Olympic context, there does need to be training and education, but that it doesn't just need to be a formality, it has to be like a living, breathing document, it has to be part of the culture. Everybody needs to be in agreement and know that uh, we don't condone this. Um, this is a safe environment for everyone. And if something's happening, this is who you can tell and we're going to help you. So I think if that permeates through the whole culture, then it, maybe the training will seem less like a formality. And in terms of the scene, I don't know, because everything's so informal. If people are training in you know, people's houses or garages and community centers just hire a hall like who's it's, it's really difficult to control isn't it so i think really it's a it's an attitude shift that we need <clears throat> which seems to have started to happen in 2020 with the uh with our me too moment that we had there so i think we need to build on that well 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 where people are listening you know Thank you, Emma. And we'll come back again in the discussion for people that need a bit more time to formulate uh, your questions and comments. For Emma, thank you so much, Emma. Um, our uh, last presentation of, of today is um, by two presenters. We've got Frida Frost, uh, known as B-Girl Frost, um, who is a dance, sports, and hip hop scholar and is doing her doctorate on breaking at the Institute for Dance and Movement Culture at the German Sport University. She's a breaker herself, and she's re researching the transnational flows and cultural influences of breaking movements. She's currently working at the Goethe, maybe I'm not saying that right, Institute in Morocco, in Rabat, Morocco, and is a lecturer at the University of Paderborn, a freelance dancer and dance teacher. And she's co-authoring the work for us for the issue with Jespal Naville, who's a lecturer of applied linguistics and English language at the Open University. His personal, spiritual, and professional interests led him to study Indian hip hop cultural expression, especially in Delhi since 2013. Although not a breaker himself, he became invested in understanding why breaking offers opportunities for young people in India to build powerful solidarities across class, caste, and age, but not so much across gender and sexuality. His first book, Transcultural Voices, Narrating Hip Hop Culture in Complex Delhi, includes a chapter on embodied constructions of masculinity and breaking ciphers in Delhi. Great, thank you so much, Mary. Um, can you all see the PowerPoint? I guess so, yeah. All right, let me just stick, make this a bit bigger. Here we go. So yeah, my name is Jaspal. Um, together with Frida, I'll be presenting to you about the topic about cu of culturally sustaining formalization of breaking in Morocco and India, chances and challenges for professionalization and achieving gender equality. Oops. Oh, that's my name. <laughs> Here we go. It's all a bit slow. Um, here we go. 
Frida, would you like to go? Yeah, so we want to present ourselves shortly. So I'm Frida at Beagle. Mary already mentioned it. I'm also a PhD student, hip hop activist and organizer. And uh, currently I'm living in Morocco uh, since about two years. And I already been uh, between Germany and Morocco since about 10 years. So I'm kind of a member of the local breaking scene. I've been participating in a few events and just like um, observing the scene since about uh, 10 years. Yeah, and my name is just Paul. I'm not a b-boy, as Mary has already pointed out, but I'm a, I'm a big fan, um, and I've been attending all the all the talks in this series, and I'm I'm really chuffed to be to be part of this series. So thank you very much. I'm an academic and an ethnographer. I'm interested in uh, hip hop and especially breaking culture in India. And the interesting thing about my relationship to India was that sort of when I went out to India studying, trying to study hip hop for my PhD, I expected to see a lot of rappers. <laughs> But actually, there were hardly any rappers. Everyone were, were breakers, right? So I started to shift my interest much more into like body language and 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 sort of um, ideas of construction of uh, masculinity uh, through breaking. And my book, uh, Transcultural Voices: Narrating Hip Hop Culture in Complex Delhi, just came out um, earlier this year. Welcome to check it out. Um, yeah. So. Um... I was following a little bit the development of uh, the scene in uh, Morocco, so um, I got the idea with Jasper together to do this research. And our uh, basic approach is that breaking culture is usually informally organized and a bottom-up culture. It's uh, shaped by each one, teach one, and we call it street knowledge. So our autodidact uh, achieved uh, knowledge. And when breaking becomes Olympic uh, sport or discipline, we can expect uh, different degrees of top-down institutional formalization. Right. And we, we get this idea of culturally sustaining formalization from uh, Django Paris and Samuel Lim, who wrote this amazing book, Culturally Sustaining Pedagogies. Um, and what they understand as culturally sustaining pedagogies is to is, is a type of pedagogy or education that sustains, that means perpetuates and fosters linguistic, literate and cultural pluralism as part of schooling for positive social transformation. Culturally sustain, sustaining pedagogies positions dynamic cultural dexterity or skills as a necessary good and sees the outcome of learning as additive rather than subtractive. That means that uh, sort of the, what, what they understand as culture here is not something that is a, seen as a problem, especially for racialized children um, and youth in the United States, but rather as something that needs to be added on to other formal uh, sort of educational skills. Um, this results in uh, or entails a remaining a whole, an idea of the whole rather uh, then framed as something as broken or kids as broken or knowledge as broken as critically engage, engage enriching strength rather than replacing deficits culturally sustaining pedagogy exists wherever education sustains the life ways of communities who have been and continue to be damaged and erased through schooling and so what we are trying to do really with this notion of culturally sustaining formalization is bring together csp culturally sustaining pedagogy with the idea of um, formalization of inform what are essentially informal structures, namely breaking um, and education in breaking and transmission in breaking. So that's kind of where we kick off from our, our sort of um, um, theoretical angle, as you wish. Um, and of course, it's not very well um, articulated here in this very short presentation, but we hope to do a bit more work on this in, in the actual um, written publication, okay? Yeah, so for the moment, we are focusing on uh, specific uh, questions which are leading our research. And we are asking um, how can the formalization of breaking can be organized in culturally sustaining ways. I think this we just explained a little bit where our approach is coming from. And then we want to look at how breaking is introduced uh, as an Olympic discipline in Morocco and India. Um, which is an ongoing process uh, since uh, I think about a year or something like this in Morocco at least. And um, we want to pay particular attention to questions of opportunities of professionalization, of achieving gender equality 
end, and this uh, came out as a kind of uh, important question, the access for dancers uh, from the Global South. And this is also a question was what, which was discussed in the last um, speaker series, the question of access actually for dancers from all over the world. Yeah, and we want to give you a very short uh, contextualization of the two uh, breaking scenes. Um, so Morocco is a constitutional monarchy. Um, breaking itself is officially organized within the Federation uh, of Fitness, Aerobic and Hip Hop. So we already see a contradiction here. Um, breaking mainly is seen and uh, danced in the big cities like um, Casablanca, Rabat, uh, Tanger, uh, Agadir. And uh, it's organized um, like everywhere in the world in the smaller local communities, which are also organizing small self-organized events. Um, but the bigger events uh, always need to get a permission from the Federation and introduce also the logo of the Federation for the event, the event um, advertisement and flyer. Um, geographically, it's near to Europe, so it's also very much um, influenced by inspiration from Europe, the breaking scene, of course, and also emigration. Uh, many uh, breakers uh, emigrate to Europe, and the most uh, famous example is maybe the world champion Lil Zhu, who is also a big motivation and inspiration for the dancers who are in Morocco. Great, and India is a parliamentary, still secular, I'm not so sure if how long that will still be the case, democracy, the, the, the biggest democracy in the world, the second largest country in the world. Um, and breaking is officially organized within the All India Dance Sport Federation or the AIDSF. Um, breaking scenes exist in all what India calls first tier cities as well as second tier cities, smaller cities. Um, and is really kicked off in the early 2000s, around 2006, 2007. There was a first sort of breaking hype um, that was also quite sustainable in the sense that it didn't like ebb off like the breaking hype maybe in the 80s, which also existed in India. Um, underground and commercial events happen regularly. Um, for instance, the biggest event, I guess, that many people of you, uh, many of you might have followed was Red Bull BC One World Finals that happened in Mumbai in 2019. And because of its geographical location, India is also connected to many other Asian countries and their breaking scenes, such as, for instance, uh, South Korea. Um, and uh, through the work, especially of the Korean Cultural Center, as well as Europe and especially Germany, um, because um, there were several projects run by the Goethe Institute. And I think Frida was, was, uh, was down in India in 2012 as well, as part of the Indo-German Hip Hop and Urban Art Project. Um, right, so this is uh, something we found on the IOC's website. This is uh, sort of an agenda for the uh, 2024 uh, Olympic uh, Games. And as we, we heard last uh, week, or, uh, sorry, last month already, I think Sonia talked about this. There's, a, there's this emphasis on youth and gender equality, right? So four additional youth sports have been incorporated. Uh, for instance, break, and, and one of them is breaking. And one of, their, one of the aims of the Paris Olympics is that they will achieve full gender equality. Okay, and this is really, for us, I mean, for me, as especially who is like study breaking in, um, in India and it's saw only men doing it almost, there's a sort of a contradiction going on here, right? Because on the one hand, we want this youth cultural sport. On the other hand, we want um, gender equality. So how will that actually pan out for the, for the cases of India and Morocco? Now, as I said, breaking and hip hop at large are very much dominated by cis males. Um, and as a result, breaking orients, orients to imaginaries of heterosexual masculine bodies and movements. And this has been very well documented in, uh, in, lit in the literature. Um, now, one of the aims, as I said, is, uh, is uh, achieving full uh, gender equality across all disciplines in the Paris 2024 Olympics. Is this a contradiction? How does the imposition of gender equality affect local scenes dominated by men? Are there enough competitive B-girls in all countries to be sent to the Paris uh, Olympics 2024? How can B-girls be supported in culturally sustaining ways? These are some of the questions that, that came up during our research, as well as the big question of access uh, to of dancers from the Global South and especially of female dancers from the Global South. 
So what we did was partly due to COVID because we couldn't travel so much, or I, at least I couldn't travel to India. I'm, I'm in the UK at the moment. Um, we, we decided to administer a uh, two online questionnaires, one for Morocco, one for India, to get a first glimpse of breakers' opinions and attitudes and thoughts about breaking, becoming an Olympic discipline in 2024. Responses were very low, so we had 14 and 19 respondents, so the findings should not be interpreted as being quantitatively representative of the two countries' breaking scenes. Yet, the responses provided us with some basic understanding of some of the perceived chances and challenges of breaking, becoming an Olympic disciplines. Um, and the questionnaire, we should also say the questionnaire is only uh, part of one, is one part of a multi-methodological research that Frida and I are conducting con um, at the moment. We are also using qualitative interviews and participant observation over time. So here's just some basic demographic data. I'm not going to go into all the details. Uh, this is age, um, the question of are you a breaker or not, and gender identification. So what we can see is that most of the breakers in our quest who responded to our questionnaire were relatively young. They were between the ages of 18 and 29. Um, um, most of them consider themselves as breakers in both countries. Now, there's one interesting thing here about the gender question. Uh, in Morocco, we would have some sort of, I guess, representative question of eight, uh, uh, response of 85% of the respondents being male and 14% being female. Now, in India, that's completely the opposite. It's 73% female, right, um, and only 21% men. So this is, of course, not representative of the entire breaking scene. What happened was that actually Frida shared this questionnaire on her uh, Instagram and Facebook um, and so one breaker, one B girl from India uh, shared it in her own networks. Um, so here we can see that, that there's, there's sort of a skewing in, in, the, in the respondents, which in some ways was really helpful for us because we got a lot of B girls speaking about um, issues of gender. Um, in terms of attitudes and knowledge, what was what was sort of interesting was that everybody, almost everybody knew that breaking would become a, this, a Olympic discipline in 2024. And most people also thought that it was somewhat a good thing or beneficial uh, thing to for breaking to become a Olympic discipline. But only half of the respondents um, considered becoming or entering the Olympics themselves. Okay. Yeah, so we give you now a little bit more uh, insights about the, um, the respondents. And I have to add that uh, because I am in Morocco, I could already start with some qualitative interviews and I could also uh, already do some participant op observation. Um, but our information here is mainly from the questionnaire. Mm. So um, I think it's one before my Jasper, no? Can you go back one slide? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, one question was like, why do you want to participate? And here the answers were really ranging from, no, my level's not high enough to I'm helping as a coach or I'm interested to participate as an athlete to uh, represent uh, my country and have the experience. Um, but also uh, the answers were being like, um, no, at the moment I'm more underground and hip hop, uh, maybe later. So here we already see that the Olympics are not seen as uh, belonging to the, the breaking scene, to the culture. Um, another question was, um, if in your opinion, uh, there's anything bad or problematic about breaking becoming an Olympic discipline and about 50% said like no, and others raised concerns of breaking, uh, losing creativity or diversity or getting away apart from the hip hop culture and spirit. So again, it's like pointing inside this question of cultural sustainability informalization. Um, and uh, still 62% uh, uh, of the dancers thought that Morocco has enough qualified breakers, but that the possibilities for them to exchange and especially to travel um, stops them from reaching an international level. So here we are clearly addressing this question of access for dancers of the global south. So um, why is the access so important? Uh, we want to take a small look here that um, where do 
dancers practice in Morocco? What are possibilities for prof professionalization or challenges? So there is a lack of training possibilities. Um, the majority trains outdoor. This is reinforced uh, to Corona where most uh, practice places were closed for nearly uh, two years actually. Um, so there is um, the difficulty practicing public space. Dancers can get kicked out. Um, they get, can get problems with the police. It can be dangerous to train at night um, or near bad neighborhoods, difficult neighborhoods, and many uh, breakers are coming from uh, difficult neighborhoods. So uh, there's also the problem of the lack of travel possibilities due to the visa policies which uh, Moroccan dancers are facing, a lack of uh, high-level competitions as most competitions are national or local competitions without uh, international guests um, and a lack of cultural of movement uh, knowledge. Mm, still, the Olympics gives hope for a lot of dancers as um, a justification to be a dancer, to be a break dancer, because still in Morocco, the connection to breaking is because it's still practiced on the street mainly, it's connected to the street, which is equivalent for uh, drugs and crime. So they hope that the, the Olympics might give a positive uh, connotation to breaking. Um, they also hope that, uh, quote, the Olympics will open new doors, uh, especially those for those uh, from disadvantaged communities whose mobility and access to the world events is limited, end quote. So this uh, regarding the question of global access we also have to question if this is actually true. Um, and here we can also see that the Federation, for example, um, they are organizing Moroccan championships. They just held the qualifications where I could do uh, participant organizations. They explained uh, the new judging system. They had also two breaking camps for the uh, national winners of last year. Um, but there is no sustainability. This is at least what um, dancers told me and also what we see in the questionnaire. Um, there is no payment. The contracts for the athletes are not delivered or for the coaches. So there is a big uh, gap between what the Federation is showing what they want to do and what the dancers are experiencing. And there's one quote I want to give as impression for this uh, challenge, which dancers have with the Federation. A dancer was saying, quote, I think the Federation is doing the opposite, giving b-boys and b-girls false promises that don't come true, resulting in a loss of motivation and hope, end quote. So we see that there is a big challenge here going on. And then the question of uh, gender equality, equality in Morocco. Um, so we have the difficulty of cultural and social obstacles like traditions and expectations for, from the society. Um, of course, we also have the lack of safe spaces as practice is happening outdoor and the public space is still a very male space and also not always safe. And um, there was one dancer giving a nice quote, um, I want to read it out, quote, our society can make women feel attacked or judged when they decide to pursue this discipline under the pretext that a woman cannot dance, which is in contradiction with our true culture since women have always danced in our folk dances and traditional celebrations, end quote. So this is a very interesting quote for me because it's showing there is an idea that women are dancing, but in the same way not. So there's a contradiction here. What are women allowed to dance and what they're not allowed to dance, how they're allowed to show and move their bodies. Um, of course, which we see in many um, other countries as well, there is a lack of role models and examples that females can look up to. And uh, one thing which I want to point out, which is interesting for me, is um, there seems to be no reflection on the role of behavior between b-boys, from b-boys towards b-girls in the scene. And the discussion is only referring to the society, to the dancers, like to society, to the b-girls, but not between the dancers themselves, between b-boys and b-girls. So this is something which I find very interesting and which, uh, yeah, I would like to follow uh, more. Yeah, if you just like quickly move through some of the data from India, um, why do you want to participate in the Olympics? And the answers range similar to the, to the answers from Morocco about representing my country, gaining experience, finding an avenue for growth. Um, but also there's a, a slight hesitation that Frida already pointed out, not sure at first I want to experience it step by step, then I will go for participation, or I've never been attracted to the bigger stage events, but more of the jams organized by the hip hop community. So again, we find this sort of separation between underground and, and mainstream or commercialization, I guess. 
Um, is anything bad, problematic about breaking, becoming an Olympic discipline? The majority finds that there are many issues, such as the purity of the dance form will change. It will definitely lose the essence of the culture, the ciphers. Politics will definitely come in between corrupt governments and the Federation again, right? I will come back to the Federation in a moment. Um, in your opinion, is there anything good about breaking becoming an Olympic discipline? The majority of respondents think that breaking uh, will open uh, or Olympic breaking will open new opportunities for funding, employment and recognition for breakers and dancers in general. Um, from all over society and all families. And 83% think that India has enough qualified breakers, but they are not supported by governments and they are hardly any sponsored international level jams. And again, we have this, this question of global uh, South access. Um, um, what are the main challenges for professionalization? There's a lack of training possibilities, lack of social recognition for breaking, and lack of high-level competitions, lack of funding, lack of support. The main issue seems to be a large mistrust against the All India Dance Sport Federation, and I quote three th uh, quotes here. The Federation of India is bullshit. They promised that the winners would be taken to Paris for championship, but they don't do any of it. In fact, no cash prize, nothing. AIDSF president's daughter, who is not even a B-girl, was judging the event along with four B-boys. Um, her each vote, here each vote, vote of the judges mattered. Her single vote changed so many decisions. Um, the current federation is a big scam. We need a more organized federation with organ, original break-in leaders from each city and each state. So what we see here is that there's a mistrust against sort of a centralized idea of organizing dance, sport, um, and, and accusations of corruption as well. Um, and then finally, what are some of the challenges for achieving gender equality? I'm just going to go through some of these things very quickly. Um, and the first quote actually is something that Frida noticed isn't, doesn't exist in Morocco. Um, what the first quote says here, actually, for Indian b-boys need to change their thought process to think that we are not, we women are not good enough to participate. And also B girls need to think that it's always not about more power. It's a mind plus techniques with style and flavor, right? A second quote, also very interesting. We need more B girls as judges. I think this will change a lot. Um, I will, I will just skim through some of the other uh, parts here. So the third one, for instance, fourth one actually says, um, B girls were never underrepresented. It's a clear call of dedication and your love, passion towards the art. Um, taking things for granted won't work in your life. You've got to work hard, no gender issue, right? And, and I think that there's an interesting point here about meritocracy, about like, yeah, if you just work hard enough, you will get there and forgetting about sort of structural inequalities and structural oppression. Um, but most uh, respondents, remember most respondents were B-girls, uh, thought that B-girls were underrepresented in, hi in hip hop in India and worldwide. Um, they were saying that we need more facilities, more safe spaces, good mentors, and so on. Um, there's also some talk about uh, families. I'm not gonna go into this in more detail now, um, but uh, I just wanted to mention that. So it is cultural, family social ties are also, of course, an obstacle for B-girls to, um, to sort of make it in the scene and then make it into the Olympics, potentially. Okay, so uh, just to finish up, um, so we've really got like all this data, we still need to like, you know, kind of work our way around, get our heads around this. Um, but I think one of the main issues for Frida and me was to reflect on this notion of Global South access, questioning who has access and in sort of looking at the intersections of this particular Global South access with, with gender, right? Um, I think one of the main findings is in both countries, there's a huge mistrust against any sort of uh, formalized organization um, uh, like the federations and any formal structures. Um, and then there are some sort of Western, I would say Western perspective or liberal, neoliberal meritocratic ideas that everybody has access if they want to be, if they want to have access. And I think this needs to be questioned from a critical 
sort of research point of view. Um, and in terms of achieving gender equality, um, what 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 two two ideas I think are very dominant. One is creating uh, safe spaces for women to practice, for be girls to practice, and in fact, I, I've seen it in the in the chat already. N not just be girls. I think queer queer heads, uh, intersex people, um, everybody who is not cis male uh, in that sense. Um, so we need safe spaces for them to access uh, training facilities and, and funding as well, um, as well as changing b-boys attitudes towards b-girls. Um, and I think that links back in with the, with the talk we had, uh, we heard um, just a moment ago. Frida, do you want to add anything? No, thank you very much for listening and uh, yeah, curious about questions. Thank you. Thank, you. thank, thank you, you so much for a wonderful presentation. You'll see, um, I'll just give you a moment in the chat. There's been really um, great comments um, and conversations. Does anyone who commented in the chat or anyone here have any um, pressing questions about um, the material presented? I wonder if you close your, um, uh, if you stop sharing, yeah, just in case there's questions. Uh, yeah, Alex. Hi, yeah, I was kind of wondering in this question of um, uh, parity or so this goal for um, there being the same number of, of uh, quote unquote men and quote unquote women in the competitions and if there's this perception that there aren't really enough people to compete in the category of women. Um, if our conversations about the judging changes would play in here where if it is not an absolute system, but rather this comparative system, if that allows for sort of whoever is the best uh, from each country, hopefully, <laughs> who's coming to be um, assessed based on who, who's there rather than some kind of absolute um, number that would, I don't know, be seen as potentially embarrassing or whatever the question would be, um, but rather that it just sets up like an assessment of the participants as they are or as they have been um, brought to the um, event. Yeah, I don't know how it will be organized, um, to be honest. I don't know if it is if it is a 50-50 uh, quota or um, I don't know, Frida, can you say something about this? Because I know you've just participated in a in a qualifier, um, and uh, I know there were only three B girls and twenty or thirty B boys. Yeah, so I, I didn't really got your question, so I will try to answer as best as I think. Um, so, for example, in Morocco, there were qualifiers um, for qualifiers, uh, regional qualifiers. I was in the qualifier for Casablanca. There were about sixty B boys and five B girls. Um, in Rabat, there may be thirty B boys and four beagles in Agadir it was kind of the same um Magnus last one was kind of the same so uh we can say in Morocco I think they're like 95 percent b-boys and maybe five maybe not even five percent b-girls so what they're doing they're narrowing down the the possibility the competitor comp uh, the participants for the, the main competition. So there will be the final now uh, with the best um, 16 b-boys and best 16 B girls. Mm. But to say that in Morocco, in this Beagles, 16 Beagles, which, which will compete, uh, there's me inside, there's one other European Beagle inside. We are two European Beagles in Morocco, which are living there and uh, practicing. The third Beagle who is uh, kind of um, trying to reach international level is uh, training with us. Um, and uh, there is actually no other Beagle which is on a level to go to the Olympics. So I think the, um, the selection process of the Federation will be more like trying to push this one person who is, um, who, who's bringing the qualities then to really push the whole Beagle scene. This is what I see, um, but maybe it will change. They're also just like starting to get an idea how to organize themselves. And we can clearly see that the Federation themselves, they're not really, um, they they don't really have a clear structure yet how to actually support the the dancers in a sustainable way 
so we we have to observe a little bit longer like what's actually happening because it's last year was like the first year with two training camps with beagles inside uh, in the first camp and the second camp there were already less beagles they chose only two in the first there were five so it's it's very unclear at the moment actually how it's going to go yeah uh thanks for that i was just thinking too if i can um <coughs> um think through it with you i know in terms of dance board in Canada, there's been a conversation about the distinction between equality and equity. So equality would say everyone can get involved and equity is kind of actively working to make, um, to, to engage everyone, actually to interpolate them to the cause, to shout out that this is for you as well. So it might be inviting B-girls into spaces and encouraging them um, as a way to get to, uh, a more equitable uh, space. And I think we can think, Emil said something in the comments here about also thinking about that in terms of ethnicity and race and racialized people and thinking about how black people get associated with crime and drugs and how the media participates in that. So there's some really good conversation going on in the chat as well about what we can think about racial equity um, as we move toward the Olympic moment. So I guess my question for you is around equality versus equity and the insight that I can share is I know the WDSF is thinking about rounds and competitions because right now B girls have less rounds to do and they really want to work up to an equality model, right? Where there'd be the, the same amount of rounds for men and women and where does equity fit into the conversation? So just wondering about your terminology. <laughs> is it academic to academics? Um, what's the choice of equality versus equity in your work? Yeah, no, thanks. I think that's that's absolutely right. I think from a form formalized from the institutional perspective, I think we need to push for equity. Now, I think there's something there's a problem with that because there's there's a that that sort of it, for me it sounds like affirmative action as well, right? So we need to identify who are sort of who are the people who are disadvantaged, who are oppressed. Uh, we need to give them more resources, perhaps. Um, than those people who are not oppressed right now. And I feel in terms of, uh, and I see Emil's like, comment here, of course, like in a context like South Africa or the US, like settler colonial state where white supremacy um, or Canada and that uh, for that matter, where white supremacy is a, is a sort of a reality. Um, we, have, we, have these, uh, we have these racialized structures. Um, and I think we can sort of identify more or less easily <laughs> Um, no, sorry, take that away, not, not easily, but we can identify or we hope to identify who are the ones who need more support. And I think this is a bit problematic when, when it comes to women and men. Um, and I, I'm not, because it is always in all sports, there's a, there's a distinction, right? There's a female version of it and a male version of it. And they don't really mingle. They don't really compete against each other, right? And I think that that is in some ways the problem. Um, in, in terms of equity, because we are not trying to get everybody on the same level, uh, but we are trying to make two clubs in some ways. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, before we, I see Frost has a question. I just wanna to move to Devora first um, to do a response, because I know Frost will set us up <laughs> as well for the conversation and discussion that follows. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Devora, who's our respondent for today, Devora Myers. Um, the first time I met her, I was in New York City. I was going to go meet Joe Schloss at a park uh, party going on. And in walks this brilliant uh, B-girl who had been doing work. And I think she just got her book contract for writing a book on the gymnastics at the Olympics. She was about to write a book then. And uh, just absolutely brilliant. So I'm really honored that you could join us today and grace us with your presence because you've been, you're just in the trenches doing this work about the Olympics for so long. And you've got um, knowledge of breaking. So it's, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and just to read a, your brief bio, uh, she's a journalist writer. She's the author of The End of the Perfect Ten about women's gymnastics. She covers Olympic sports for various publications, including 538, Vice, The Guardian, etc. And we saw her referenced in Paul's uh, talk. He quoted her right, right in the opening to set off his talk. So Devorah, if you want to respond um, with any of the things that the talks today made you think about. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I remember meeting you, but I don't remember if I had my book contract then. Um, I think that 
I don't know if that was the case, but um, it was a very fun day. I think we all went for dinner after that. <laughs> um, you know, thanks so much, everyone. All the presentations were so interesting, and I'm kind of going to be jumping all over the place, trying to respond to various things. Like I have a whole screen full of notes, so hopefully I'll get to. Hopefully it'll be coherent. Um, and you know, when I started writing about Olympic sports, you know, 15 years ago, I never thought that like my new passion breaking would ever factor into it. <laughs> and then, um, you know, in 2016, I saw on like Facebook, like everyone else, or I don't know where everyone else heard about um, the IOC adding breaking to these Olympic games. So all of a sudden, like my breaking passion and my Olympic expertise are on a collision course. Um, so it's been really interesting to sort of watch this develop and, you know, got an opportunity to cover a little bit of breaking. Um, I kind of want to start with Emma's, um, Emma's um, discussion of sexual abuse and, and harassment um, and specifically around Larry Nasser and around Olympic sports, because um, that, you know, if I was covering gymnastics for the past five or six years, obviously I've I've done a, some work there and a couple of things, you know, when um, breaking started to have its Me Too moment in like 2020, when some of those Instagram posts started to go up, I remember sitting there thinking like, well, how do you police it here? Cause there is no structure as far as, you know, like formalized structure. Cause even in a sport like gymnastics, which is highly formal, formalized, it's done an abysmal job of it. I think that's pretty, pretty clear to say. And Sorry, I'm just gonna just give me one moment. Um, and you know, when you're talking, when you're talking about grooming, um, that's also talked a lot about in the context of child child sexual abuse and um, with a coach or pers a person in position of authority grooming a younger athlete. Where in that situation, the relationships are very clearly delineated, right? The coach or the judge or the team doctor and the athlete. And I think with, with breaking, and I have to admit that I haven't been to a practice in three years. So I can't, you know, I'm not sure exactly what all the facts on the ground are like at this exact moment, but you know, things were always pretty loose and informal. And even, so technically you're all just dancers, you're all just B-boys and B-girls, but we all know when you walk into a practice, like who's the really good dancer, you know, who has more, um, informal authority right and that's someone who's obviously has more power and so but the question is like how do things like safe sport handle that right um and it's something that came up when i was doing not about gymnastics but figure skiing and writing about john coughlin who's a u.s pair skater who was accused of sexually assaulting other skaters when he was an athlete and and, and very tragically he um he died by suicide within a few weeks of the um, allegations being made public and he was under investigation from safe sport. And that always like opened up a lot of questions about, you know, how do you police athlete on athlete, you know? And I think it's similar to discussions of like, how do we, um, how do we not police, I don't wanna use that term, but like, how do we handle allegations when there isn't necessarily an obvious power difference or at least it's not, formalized, right? You know, I, he as a male pair, pair skater had more power than I think than, you know, female skaters who are, um, unfortunately, there are many more ma um, female skaters looking for male partners than male. And so he was a really good skater. So he had always had more power in that dynamic, but on paper, they're the same, right? And so how do you, it's hard to draw those like clear lines, like, you know, now in gymnastics, like coaches and coaches and athletes never allowed to be alone together, right? But how do you do that in a social group? And you can't. And so we have to sort of figure out strategies of making, of dealing with allegations and, you know, and, and shifting cultural norms and keeping everyone safe. But I think it's more, um, you know, it's, I don't want to say easier, because even though technically things are clearer when it's like a coach athlete or a doctor athlete, um, they're still obviously being tremendously messed up in terms of how, you know, allegations are of abuse are heard and how they're investigated and how they're adjudicated. Um, and I'm not exactly sure. I, I assume that um, USA Dance it has their relationship to Safe Sport. Um, there is just wide athlete dissatisfaction with how Safe Sport is run. Um, it was, um, though it was sort of comes about or it's like officially opens its doors, the US Center for Safe Sport, it comes after 
the Larry Nassar allegations were first made public. It actually was in the works before those allegations. And it starts as a really as a branding exercise for the US OPC. Um, their first copyright, I think, was 2014, and the Larry Nassar allegations are in 2016. So you have this institution that is really there to protect the bigger institution because obviously from liability and from bad press to be like, oh, look, we're doing something. And so it doesn't mean we give up on it, but I think people have to have an awareness of how um, lacking its own processes are and how small its budget is relative to its task. Um, you know, And I think it just got some more money from Congress and some more money from the NGBs, but it's still, you know, especially since there is no historical limit on how far back the allegations can go. So we're having people come forward with very serious allegations that stretch back decades. So it really is not large enough and not well-resourced enough to, to, to do this, to take care of this task. So that was just some stuff that I wanted to sort of say about abuse. And, um, you know, and I wanted, to, I'm sorry if I'm jumping around. <laughs> um, I'm not a great extemporaneous speaker. So um, I apologize for that. Um, you said just, writing and tweeting um and and then you know the the problems you know that paul brought up in his his um presentation about like all of the ills of the olympic movement which are 100 percent true um and i've you know i've read about those and but i guess the question is is like all that being true how do we keep that in mind take that into account but just realize this is happening anyway like you know um if I recall correctly, it was like kind of WDSF sort of nominates breaking for Youth Olympic Games. It didn't really have much in terms of connections to the community and then breaking is selected. And there wasn't like a robust internal community, community discussion about whether or not this was something that B-boys and B-girls around the world wanted to do. And so then there was just very much this feeling like the train is off the station, you gotta get on or, you know, get on or get off the tracks, right? And we've seen, you know, it has not, you know, like skateboarding just made its debut, surfing just made its debut. You know, the first of the action sports was 98 with um, snowboarding and that was not without a lot of controversy. And now that sort of seems to be fine, I guess. Like, I think it's worked out, but um, the question is worked out for whom? It definitely worked out for the Olympics. Um, it's unclear whether it worked out for snowboarding it's definitely worked out for individuals in snowboarding. You have Sean White, who's a huge star. You know, you have people like Chloe Kim. So it's definitely worked out for some people. The question is whether it's worked out for the community as a whole. And that's not a question I am able to answer. Um, so, um, you know, and I think, you know, one of the points that, that Paul raised was about um, the fact that the B-boys and B-girls have to raise money to train, to get places, and like, where is, all this money, these billions of dollars in Olympic movement, why are they not, <laughs> why isn't it helping the athletes? And the answer is that's, I think about 4% of the overall Olympic revenue trickles down to the athletes. And that's just true across the sports. And, you know, I don't know necessarily what it is that B-boys and B-girls can do to change that, at least for themselves, but it's something to be aware of that, you know, if you look at where the money is allocated, the athletes are always the lowest priority you know people you know administrators have six-figure salaries they have per diems and athletes are using gofundme to get themselves to competitions or to get their families to competitions to watch them i guess maybe that's not a problem in COVID anymore but that has always been the case and there's always been a lot of complaining about like i don't want to say complaining makes it sound like they're being whining, but there's been there's always been a lot of talk about this, and there doesn't seem to have been much movement on it in a long time. It just is a point that everyone just keeps bringing up every Olympics, and then it just kind of goes away, and the funding situation doesn't change. And I don't know exactly what money is filtering in from the IOC to the International Federation down to the national, the you know, the national level federations, and how that disbursement looks. Um, I would have to look more into that, but I think that is, it seems like that is following the standard that had already been set by the Olympic movement for many decades. Um, and, and I think, you know, another thing that I was thinking about in response to Paul's, um, Paul's talk was, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not super concerned about this for breaking because even just in the response, responses to 
sorry, Frida and Jess, um, Jess Bell, sorry if I said anyone's name wrong, um, conversation that people don't seem, the, the b-boys and b-girls seem at least a little skeptical of the Olympics, um, have some hopes of, uh, attached to it, but have concerns. Um, because, you know, if you came up as a dancer, you weren't dreaming of the Olympics, you know, this wasn't even anything on the horizon. So you had other sort of aspirations, you had other priorities. But I think it's important to keep in mind that you don't ever want your sport to be too tightly tied to the Olympics because it can also be eliminated. So if your entire, um, you know, they drop sports all the time, right? And, and so you have to really make sure that like, even as you try to make the Olympics work for, for the dance community to not get too attached to this because it can go away. Now, right now, I think it's not even a permanent sport, but let's say we're to become a permanent sport, it can be eliminated. It's happened to wrestling. It's happened to so many sports. So you don't want, you know, definitely want to keep, you know, your independent structures and your competitions, everything like that, very robust and very separate from the Olympics. Because if this goes away, you still want to have a scene, you want to have a community, you want this, you know, the art to keep evolving. And, and I, sorry, um, I told you I'm a little bit all over the place, but everyone said so many smart things. Um, <laughs> And one of the things in writing a lot about gymnastics, you know, and how intertwined the rules become with this development. Initially, if you look at gymnastics, it was like kind of the athletes sort of pushing the boundaries and the rules catching up. And now if you look at how the code of points looks, it's more the code dictating and the athletes adapting. And I don't know, like I spoke to Storm and Renegade early in like 2017, I think early into Trivium. And, you know, they, they had those concerns in mind. I don't know exactly what the exact system looks like at this very moment, but it's also something to keep in mind that, you know, that the, you don't want, like, you know, you have to sort of formalize things and standardize things for Olympic competition. But what, what's make, what makes breaking so much so great. And one of the things I loved after coming out of gymnastics into, into breaking was just, you could do anything, you know, if you made, if you made it look good. And now it seems like, you know, it's how are we going to manage the development of the dance alongside its trajectory as a sport, which has a whole different set of considerations. And, um, and just one last thing about gender. I, I think it was Frida who said that they're like, we need that their B girls have said things like we need more women as judges. Um, there's so many terrible things about gymnastics, but the one good thing is, is that actually the Women's Technical Committee has always controlled women's gymnastics from the start, which is um, about the only progressive thing about the whole damn sport that I love, but it's really, you know, so that's the last thing and I have nothing else. Thank you so much for all of your insights. And I know you, I, because I spoke to you not too long ago, I just know You've got so many insights about kind of the history of the Olympics and how we fit in. And there was one thing you said that inspired me. So maybe you could share it with everyone because it really stuck in my head. And it was something about women being excluded and creating their own events outside the Olympics. Do you remember telling me about, can you share that as well? I just, I just put that into a story on figure skating. Um, yeah, oh. so we're talking about the Women's World Games and Alice Milliot. I'm not sure if anyone knows who she is. She has sort of been lost to history, which definitely is the work of men like in the IOC and the IAAF, which is now World Athletics. Um, but basically they didn't want let women's track and field events into the Olympics in the like late teens, early twenties. So she and just a bunch of other French women just started their own competition called the Women's 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 Olympics, but they, you know, the IOC made them change the name because you know they are always proprietary about their <laughs> their trademarks. And so it's the Women's World Games. The first one was 1922, I think, and it was really popular. It was like 20,000 um, 20, um, women. I mean, 20,000 spectators came and it was very popular and they were, had about four, I think, all told. And then, you know, the IOC and the internet, the IAAF, which was the track and field, name of the track and field federation, which I think just changed to World Athletics. Um, they basically got nervous that like, oh no, they, we don't have complete control over global sports. And so they decided it was kind of better for them to take some track and field events into the Olympics for women rather than lose control over women's sports altogether. And, you know, 
better can control them. And if you look at like papers from people in IOC and IWF at that time, they're really explicit that like they had no desire to promote women in sports. They just wanted to quash them and to sort of limit them. And, um, but yeah, so this is, you know, and I even just wrote about Madge Sires, who is a figure skater who entered the 1902 world championships before there was a rule explicitly barring women from joining to, and to, to compete against the men. Now there were only a handful of competitors, but she won the silver medal as legend has it, who knows how true this is, but like Ulrich Salkow, whose name that you might hear when you watch the Olympics and figure skating, it's his jump. He gave her his gold medal, like he presented it to her. Who knows if that's true? But basically she went in a head-to-head -head competition with the men and she did fine. And then they were like, oh, we have to close that loophole. And then in 1906, they brought in the women's category. So it's just one of those things to think about how a women's category is not like, it's sometimes like a consolation prize. Like, you know, how different could figure skating have evolved if they were always allowed to go head to head. And, you know, and sort of that sort of reminds me in terms of already we're seeing these differences. Like I, you know, I think it was Frito who said there's only three rounds, like there are fewer rounds for the women than for the men in b-boying. And that's like, I was really surprised by that because um, I mean, you, you see that in tennis, right? You know, the women play best of um, best of three, right? And the men play best of five. And like, you know, that's at least old. Like you could be like, okay, they did that way back when we had allegedly had different ideas of women and their athletic capacity. Um, and you're just not gonna change it now, right? But, but we're starting something in 2024 and we're already like, treating it like women's tennis a century ago. Like, I don't, I'm really surprised by that. Yeah, thank you. I'm so chatty today as a moderator. I really am excited. We have so many great people in the room um, that now I'd like to hopefully open it up for questions and comments. Um, and bef uh, before I kind of hand it over to Frost, although I, I saw from the comments, it probably was uh, related to the equity equality question. I just want to put out that uh, Gayla put in the chat the question of intersex. So I think it's interesting to think about alternatives to the Olympics and how as a progressive hip hop dance community um, that doesn't need to rely necessarily on institutions, the mail, you know, is referring to in the chat that these institutions have problems of power and privilege. Um, it's, it's exciting to think about these alternative <laughs> um, ways of gathering and really just one more thing to say about it. I think breaking has been a model for that. Right, Al um, an alternative ways of thinking about equity and being progressive. And so it's nice to think there's opportunities for maybe a different way of organizing and keeping a structure really strong and not, not um, letting the institution overtake what's so beautiful about the community. A frost flow, okay, it's your turn, <laughs> you're up. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Um... I haven't been in university in a while, as you know, Mary, I'm a professor, so hearing this conversation is very uh, university-esque, and I can deal with the vernacular, you know what I'm saying? I appreciate it. I do want to, I do have to say that um, I, I really like what you said in relation to the culture having uh, opportunities for new perspectives and lens on equity, because it's true. When I look at um, the fact of the matter is that even locally, yeah, uh, in the breaking jams, the B-girls are competing less rounds. That's because I think that the organizers are considerate of the skill level and the level of experience that some of the dancers have or have not. And uh, if you don't break, I'm sorry, you don't know. You don't fully know unless you get down what it does to your body. You can get hurt badly, you know. Integrating a new um, uh, level of equality has to do with uh, really understanding the path of equity, you know, and developing a new culture in relation to the relationships. When we're talking about what Emma was discussing in relation to grooming and the abuse and all that different stuff, very important topics, you know, across the board, even outside of all this stuff that we're doing. But when we're thinking about, you know, having that in our mind, how do we, uh, how, how do we formulate uh, a new culture that is in tandem with some of the traditions or many of the traditions that are uh, in fact kin, you know, allowing people to have a deeper type of relationship and a trust and respect that is completely separate from a lot of other cultures and the ways that things have been happening formally in sport uh, around the world, you know, 
people, you know, ask me, I speak to parents, you know, I've been an artist educator for 18 years. I've been dancing for 24 years, you know, and parents are like, oh, I can get my boy or my girl into hockey or some sports. So what's the difference? I said, well, the difference is the cultural, the culture itself and the way that in which that we relate to people and each other. It's important to have these types of structures and this knowledge, you know, this knowledge being brought forth about what hasn't worked in the past and things to be aware of and things to see. But it's also important to extract and to kind of juice the things that do work, you know. And um, I myself here in Toronto, uh, I've trained many uh, female dancers over the years very successfully. And a lot of them have reached a personal level of success. And uh, I always have looked at them as like uh, my younger sisters and my uh, family and kinship, you know. And a lot of these uh, dancers in my past that I've worked with um, always felt that I never treated them or the people in my crew who have also trained them, I've never treated them any different than uh, um, the male dancers other than the fact that we have uh, uh, respect in terms of we're watching what we say and, you know, having manners and, you know, being uh, having some type of integrity, you know. But there's a bigger um, reality that, you know, there's something that was mentioned about uh, culture and the perpetuation of stereotypes in the public view, you know, um, and the way societies in general, a lot of people don't really even really want to get that much into breaking. Even uh, young guys, they're like, oh, I don't want to get dirty. I don't want to get hurt. And, you know, um, the, the gender roles and the view of gender and, and how that's actually performed and how people are innately, uh, it, there's a lot of intersectionalism around, um, you know, is it cool thing? Is it a, a safe thing? Uh, not just safe, you know, uh, socially, but physically as well. People are, are afraid, you know what I mean? They have this idea that, you know, you're going to go and you're going to break your neck. And it's not an attractive thing. So right now, the way I look at all this stuff is like, you know, uh, some of us have been doing the groundwork for many, many years, decades, you know? <laughs> and now all of a sudden it's a, it's a bandwagon. Now everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. Oh, okay, now we're going to teach. Oh, no, now we got to get the B-girls up to speed. Are you serious? Now it matters all of a sudden. And the voices have been silenced for so long. It's like, it matters, yes. But how do we actually look at what's actually working with people and deal with that? And perhaps that's why it's important that we have these types of discussions. But um, really, you know, I do agree with something is that there's no substitute for hard work. And it's kind of like people say, well, you know, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you got to work smart. Now we, we have to work hard and smart. You know what I'm saying? We have to look at what's actually... Uh, working in what you know the types of lenses and mentalities and habits that people have uh, in relation to how they view themselves with this culture and the validity and purpose of this culture in the first place you know everybody's so divided in our community about why they do what they do you know um and i do agree there's uh, a lack of lim you know, there's a limitation in resources there's a limitation and a lack of so many things that you know so many so many of you phd um, students and doctors, you know, very respectfully and very insightfully have mentioned, I, I completely agree with all of, of everything that's being said, but um, I really do, um, I'm urging and, and passionately, you can hear in my voice and what I'm trying to tell you is there has to come a level of participation on an intrinsic level based on your personal experience of getting involved, you know, and it's not just, I can do breaking for four years and I, I can write something about it and put it in a scholarly journal. It's like, you gotta be invested in their lifetime, like really living the culture to actually have some type of input. You know, you gotta have, to have the scrapes on your shoulders from, from doing coin drops. You know, you gotta have those calluses on your hands. You gotta, blood, you gotta bleed, sweat and cry over it. And the crazy thing is another thing that was mentioned that I do agree with is, you know, what's the return? You know, holistically, you know, as many of you do know, um, when you're getting involved, you're consumed 100% of your being. And then the output of what comes back in return doesn't always seem equitable. And you're kind of, you know, people are like, well, what the heck is the point? You know, the first thing that so many youth ask me, like, how much you get paid? How much you get paid for doing it? Why should I do it? You know, and it's like many youth who I, you know, boys, girls, you know, male, female, uh, LGBTQ+, you know, get involved in making some success and the parents look at them like, nah, you can't keep doing that stuff. You got to go to school, university, get a real job. And kind of like, okay, well, what's the goal here? You know, okay, we're going to get in the Olympics, get opportunities. But even then, we're talking about the structures being so like uh, messed up from even the foundations, you know, where 
you know, Charles was just mentioning, all oh, these guys are living in Switzerland, hotels in five stars. <laughs> it's a big joke, man. It's a big joke. I'm serious. And it's like, okay, well, how are we going to uh, juice? As I said, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but how do we juice the things that work? And what is it that we can do to actually work from the inside out, you know, to do actually an incursion? you know, to go into the, okay, we're in the Olympics. All right, so how can we share with the world how we do things that actually do work and kind of start fixing the foundations of the things in our culture that does not work, that doesn't serve all of us in an equitable way to lead towards equality. You know, we have an opportunity to talk about the deeper stories about how our culture serves people and humanity and what the real reason behind this ancient culture is manifesting in a contemporary time. Let's look about that, you know? talk about the indigenous way of knowing and how in fact that is actually the lifeblood of how we do our thing and why we do it. I think those are good conversations to have to really re-inspire the world around the lens because then you're going to have female dancers looking at themselves empowered as you know uh, powerful leaders who bring the community together you know what I'm saying and uh, yeah. men yeah. or cis men are going to be looking at it in a different way be like actually yo, that's my sister right there that's my inspiration so that I can actually grow as a person you know, so these are the things that are on my mind based off of everything that's been saying. And I'm sorry if I've offended anybody, but really, that's just my personal opinion. You can fight me for it. You can battle me for it. You can academically, scholarly me for it. You can tell me personally, I don't mind. You know, I've been in this culture long enough to say my piece and share my thing very truthfully. So that's how I feel about it. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing Frost and for joining us today. Um, um, and you've given us a lot to think about. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not cutting you off. I just know that I, we could listen to you talk all day. You've got so much wisdom from being in the trenches for so many years and contributing. Um, I do want to get to Gayla, uh, who's also got maybe a question or comment. And then Emil. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to say that I agree with you, Professor Mary, that breaking can be a way to push um, the way that traditionally sports are organized. And it's already done in some ways, like B-girls can enter like general breaking brackets, but um, well, I've been breaking for like six years and I've noticed just within that period of time that um, there's been more and more like gender segregation within breaking. And as a non-binary person, something that I really liked about breaking was that um, there wasn't the gender segregation as much when I joined when, or when I started. Um, but now like with like bigger jams, they're like pushing to like separate more. And um, I heard like B-Girl Logistics talk about this recently. Uh, she said that there should be an, a breaker only category um, which I agree with, but I don't think we should get rid of the B-girl only categories because there's so um, little B-girls in comparison to B-boys. So there still needs to be people, um, there still needs to be a separate category so more B-girls are seen. But I also think that uh, oftentimes in breaking, like um, people of queer genders are like left out of the conversation. Um, I don't think it's appropriate in any way to talk about gender e equality, only in the lens of male and female and B-boy and B-girl. And um, we don't even have words, like we don't have a title for breakers that are non-binary. Like they're forced to call themselves B-boy or B-girl. Um, like you can say they're a breaker, but you can't say breaker and then the name, you know, that's not really like common to say. So I think I've never heard anyone talk about that. And that's kind of weird in my opinion. Um, so I think in some ways breaking does push like traditional uh, ways sports organized, but in other ways that uh, it really doesn't. And it would really be nice if um, breaking could be the sport to challenge gender segregation in sports because um, people argue for the reason gender segregation exists is because of um, physical traits that give people advantages in sport, but um, there are many like physical traits that can give you advantages that aren't associated with gender, like how tall you are or um, like different things that 
you know, <laughs> I can't think of any ideas right now, but <laughs> there are hundreds of characteristics. Um, and the Olympics is only gonna push us to further separate ourselves into like, you know, male, female. So that's something I personally am really worried about because I see the way that uh, the trend is going. <laughs> and it's like, it's very disappointing because like, I don't know, I just, it was different before. And um, another thing I wanted to say was, um, I don't think we should put all our eggs in one basket with safe sport because, um, well, like was said earlier, they don't really have a big budget, but also like how much authority do they even have? Because um, I, you may have heard about this uh, fencer, Alan Hadstick, uh, he was a serial assaulter and it was really known in the fencing community. And he was allowed to go into the Olympics. So safe sport suspended him, but then he like appealed in some way. I don't know the, the details. And he was able to go and they made a whole plan to keep him away from the women. <laughs> like he had his own like accommodations. Like he went on a separate plane. He had a separate hotel. Like they went out of their way to accommodate this assaulter. So like how much authority does safe sport actually have if they can't like prevent this guy from, from representing at the Olympics? Um, there's like, a new organization started called Break Safe International. I think some B-girls in California started that. I just think that it's important for us to like um, have our own organizations for keeping people accountable um, because I'm not sure if Safe Sport will always uh, be able to like speak up effectively or act effectively. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Does anyone have any? Um, ideas about that I, I yeah there are a lot of hands shot up Gayla and I uh, just want to thank you for all of your um, contributions it's a really big conversation that needs to happen <laughs> so it's really great to see people bringing it up and uh, Frost is here in the room I think he was at my event I think in 2001 I called an event Operation B Droid because I was like, I'm so sick of the B-boy, B-girl, how it was called yeah, B-boy and I'm a B-girl. And uh, do you remember? So we had kind of robots Absolutely. on the, we were riffing off of this idea. So I'm kind of bringing that back up again because it's a conversation I wanted to have 20 years ago of like, what if I don't feel a still. binary gender? What if I just want to dance like me? I don't want to dance like a girl. I don't want to dance like a boy. And the biggest compliment mm -hmm. for me was like, when people said, you know, you just look like you when you dance. And I just thought, yeah, that's who I want to be in the world. I'm not trying to express. <laughs> Uh, gender identity. I just want to express me and and breaking gave that space. So it did allow that space. But when we the language came into it, it really divided us. So you're bringing up a really important point that right now uh, there's that split happening and what's going on there and what you know what do we have to say about that kind of way of splitting us up and you know there's advantages like you said for B girls and there's disadvantages and I know that conversation's been part of the community for a long time, but it's different when you go and you register for an event. Right, because by registering, you're consenting that you're in agreement with the terms of the event. But as a community, I think we've always been more progressive than any event right now. Um, oh, I guess I'm getting a bit political. I'm supposed to be moderating. Jason knows I'm, I'm a little bit more feisty today than usual. I'm trying to be really objective. Um, but there it's were a lot of hands right. shooting up. Uh, I know people want to comment on it. So let's go Emil, Frida, and Devor. And hopefully you can keep, if you're responding to Gala, you can keep it in your uh, mind as we go for Emil first. Hey, um, yeah, this the the, the you, you just said what what I was what I was um, thinking about that you know the when back when 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 they were just jams, they were these words were not present, but the actions were. You know, people were taken on the value of what they were bringing to the circle, as as they were, and like now that these academic words are being added to the conversation, suddenly there is a new, um, there's a new pointing of a finger where I think, and a lot of the times I feel like the, the, um, the fingers getting pointed at a culture that already was, was trying to get this to happen in the community itself, you know, and, and, I, and I give you an example of um, Sammy Alim approaching me and saying, hey, what you're doing is culturally relevant pedagogy. And I'm like, what? Uh, what, what, what did you say? Like, what? Uh, we just doing shit, like, 
this is what we do, you know? And so the words now become something that is almost stands before the, the actual bringing of people together, which is what the intention and the real deep, like historic First Nation intention of healing in that circle that goes beyond sport and the labels that are being attached to it right now, you know? Uh, and I want to say one more thing that when, when we point out, um, and, I, and I, I mentioned it in, in, in the chat, when we point out um, that hip hop is connected to streets or drugs, or I think the, the deeper conversation that must happen in academia is to look at the root cause of that conversation. Because with ads saying that, you know, it is power at play, you know, rape and, and, and abuse is an act of power. And that power on a global scale, if you really dissect it, it is related to capitalism and economics. And unless you go all the way back to that, we won't solve the problem. We need to look at the root cause of the problem to solve the problem. And a lot of people are victims of that original exploitation and global exploitation of land and of people. And 100%. so I think that is the way that we really get to solve the problem if we look at the root cause and not look at, because often we look at the lens specifically like, as a b-boy, I, I don't go to a ballet event and like, oh shit, there's two guys. I don't do that, you know? But when people come to our events, they're like, yo, where are the ladies at, you know? And I'm not saying that shouldn't happen. I'm just saying that, Again, the lens that through which people are looking at this is very skewed. Like I go to a hip hop dance event and at least 75% of female participants in the hip hop dance category, right? And I, I never say, you know, we need equity. We need to get more brothers involved. It's just the point of like making the action and taking the, taking the steps to make that a reality, which has always been what hip hop has been doing. You know, so uh, myself included, I some, I've been approached by hundreds of academics who off their first question is why is hip hop male dominant? I'm like, fuck, like, did you like actually like go to do research on the work that we've done to try and make this, uh, make this more equitable? But your first point of departure is what's happening in the academic conversations right now, you know? So anyway, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Man, that was great. Everything you just said just killed it, man. I completely agree 100%. And you know, like, if you talk to Mr. Wiggles, how did he learn his early stuff? He learned from his big sister and all the females that his were aunties. actually forming the breakers. Like, look at the foundation of this dance, really. You know, and then you're going to understand. But it's so never told. Notion. It's never told, unfortunately. Well, that's why we talk about it. It's our responsibility to educate people about that. Educate the students, the people who are practicing, the people who are already up there and remind them of the truth of where this dance really truly comes from. You know what I'm saying? So can I, can I, 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 add, one, can I add one more thing? You just said it's never told. I just, and, and I, I put this up earlier. And, and the only way that like our community is gonna get our stuff told is to tell it ourselves. Myself and Paul Ski just put together a book called Hip Hop Cultural Education because at the moment, hip hop education is just rap. That's all it is. Right. And, and, and the other elements of hip hop is not present. So only way our voices are going to get heard. And one of the conversations that myself and Polsky has been having is that we need to have our own press, our own publishing, even if we're not academics. Like, and, in, and in truth, a lot of the books in academia needs to be decoded for the for, for the culture. Because all of our, our content and our hard work has been encoded and only those conversations happen within academia and it doesn't get decoded. The people that they have done the research and in b-boying, we call it biting, they do research and then they get their, their, their doctorate, but they never ever give a, um, a honorary doctorate to the people that they did the research on. This is extractionist and capitalistic way of exploiting people's knowledge, First Nation knowledge. Thank you for that. Um, we'll go to Frida next and then Deborah. Man, I love you. Everything you said, bro, I don't know you, but I love you. Everything you said, you Stay just killed up. me. 100%. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, I just want to leave some thoughts because I think also the, the conversations we have are so important and also so complex. Um, I'm just getting like different uh, perspectives uh, since I'm in Morocco. Uh, for example, about the gender topic. Um, for me, we also always have to reflect on the context of the country. Like in Morocco, homosexuality is still illegal. 
I don't, you know, even if we are researching on it, I don't think we will get any open conversations on it. Um, so it's also, this is for me, like, it's a, it's very, uh, it's a lot of contradiction. And also what um, Gala mentioned before, like this idea of separation between B-girls and B-boys and not separation, it's an ongoing conversation. And uh, when I started breaking, I was like, no, we don't need a separation. 10 years later, I was like, wait a minute, it's kind of like creating an important platform. Um, and I think what I, what I see is that since we have platforms which are giving more um how to say respect to beagles not just to have beagle battles on the side events because this is not respectful but to have the beagles on stage with the b-boys this is more like a equity thing and since we have this and this is not very long ago it's really kind of like new and still we see it in some international world level events but i don't see it in events in germany for example so I think we always have to think about like from which perspective do we speak of uh, we are we're aware of it there are many people who are not aware of it there are many event organizers who are not aware of it and the Olympics because they are giving a must to have beagle and b-boy battles it's giving a must to organizers to also think about it a must to federations to support um, beagles and b-boys or all people who want to identify as beagles and b-boys so for me there is this contradiction the one thing the separation which is always like a something which we don't really like but in the same way the separation is creating new opportunities maybe not in uh, some countries but in other countries yes and i see that this um separation like this chance that a moroccan beagle can go to the olympics is giving the federation a big motivation to support beagles and if they're just supporting one or two they're still supporting beagles and it's going to change in the scene and for example just now in the qualifications there were four qualifications um, for hip-hop and for breaking in each qualification three judges for hip-hop three for breaking and there was only one qualification battle um, which was happening this weekend where there was one beagle in the judge and in all the other qualifications, there were only B-boys judging. Um, but to have this one B-girl in the judge is already a big step. So, you know, it's, um, I think there are so many different perspectives and complexities inside. And, and I just love the, the conversation going on here. Just want to share this with you. <laughs> Thanks, Rita. Uh, Devor, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, thanks. Um, I just wanted to jump in about um, the idea of parity and and representation. Um, I'm not, I can't remember, I think it was Emil who brought up, you know, ballet. And you can go, obviously there are significantly more female ballet dancers than there are men. But if you know anything about how ballet is run, it's run choreograph, the choreographers tend to be white men, the company directors, all these kinds of things. So you can look on the stage and see a bunch of women and think, great but then you know behind the scenes the women are seen as more disposable you know there have been all issues there have been issues of sexual assault in ballet and where the men are more prized and it's a similar dynamic that i've sort of encountered in like pair skating like i mentioned before john coughlin he has this power because he's one of the few you know and so and in ballet it's the men still who exert a tremendous amount of control even if there are a tremendous number of female dancers that almost works to their disadvantage because they are well we've just replaced you with someone else you know if you say anything about so I wanted to to touch on that and also just the way in which I think some of the people have mentioned the Olympic sort of hardened the gender categories it could be I saw in the comments someone noting that like it could be really great to sort of enforce a 50 50 and make it make like ensure that that happens but on the other hand now we are but we are really solidifying the binary and they're you know, might have been a little more flu um, fluidity there, but it's really the institutional needs and then all of the um, all the attendant testing that might come into play. We've seen it with already with intersex athletes like um, like in track and field and we're seeing it with trans athletes like in swimming. Um, and I think that's just something to keep an eye out for is that it's an inherently reactionary institution um, to its core. And it shows no signs, no matter what sort of language they use, it is, shows absolutely no signs of changing. And, you know, like Emil said, that, you know, it goes back to the problem of capitalism, even if you think about, 
you know, capitalism is a major problem distribution of where the resources go. And we see with the athletes, they don't get them. You know, they're getting, you know, it's, you know, the, I think, I think is Henry Kissinger still a member of the IOC? I can't remember, but he has been a member of the IOC and he's getting like per diems and six figure incomes for the international federation heads, depending which ones. Um, so I think I just to me keep an eye on this is, you know, as you know, we're trying to make some, we're trying to be progressive in an inherently reactionary context. Yeah, absolutely. It, I, I kind of see there's a, a really big issue with that reactionary context and the idea that this is all framed around an event structure that's outside of hip hop culture, you know, traditionally, and then, you know, having to adapt and recontextualize and move all these, you know, what are essentially, you know, um, indigenous principles or First Nation principles that are coming from a cultural practice into a formed, concretized, you know, capital driven system is what's kind of causing these tensions to to really arise. And all, all of these gaps in this reactionary space that we've identified today are like really important topics for discussion. But I'm also really interested in like how things are community led in these spaces or what potentials there are for co community leadership in these spaces and how they're mediated, distributed those, you know, that power is distributed amongst the community as well. And I think Emil talks about talked about this a few a few months ago or, or last month when he, in his talk when we we're talking about how we renegotiate you know and give back to people and give back to community and bring that that emphasis back to community and how we're also responding right now is is kind of an important uh, moment to to shift the dynamics and in the chat I saw a few people talk about how you know the Olympics needs breaking we don't need the Olympics and I think that's fundamentally like the, the the response we should be taking and and we're in a, a, a much higher um negotiating position than i think we you know people are giving credit for in a, in a lot of these sort of external not not our you know community has obviously problematized that a lot and we've talked about it in detail but yeah there's a there's a big question about like how things are traveling in different cultural cultures and and as we've seen with frida and just Bowles, talk you know there are distinct cultural and creative industry distinctions that separate the way people engage and the the world dance sport federations in each country are, are responding differently mm -hmm. um what one one question i have for uh Jespel and frida is how are you know how is breaking mediated represented and delivered as a cultural practice you know i think there's in in you know my area of of research and East and Southeast Asia, there's a there's a, a very disparate sort of representation, which comes down to what Emil was talking about about the idea of you know it being either associated as you know a street principle or low co cultural capital or, or framed as a secondary you know outsider sort of um, practice, or championed and dignified and embraced by governments, whether that's for city making and city building purposes or you know for their own agendas, but there are very distinct responses into how it's being embraced or I guess, uh, you know, susceptible for corruption in other places as, as um, Jaspel, you mentioned in India, India, there was a, the daughter of the WDSF was on the judging panel and, you know, different sort of situations like that as well occur. But anyway, yeah, I'm just curious to hear how things are mediated in those two spheres, because I think mediation plays a big role in how we interpret and understand culture as well. Yeah, I can just very briefly respond to this. I I I, I don't know exactly. Um, I think what what happens is with these these are accusations, these are these are imaginaries, these are sort of ideas about what happens, right? And because India is such a corrupt country in in terms of its institutional structures, um, as soon as we formalize breaking and we come up with some ADISF or whatever it is called that is seen as, oh, that is one of those institutions that is doing the same thing as the president is doing, as the prime minister is doing or whatever, right? So I'm not exactly sure if this is true or not true. What, what matters to me more is, is more about, you know, how do people see institutional structures and formal structures? And in the case of India, as soon as you bring in an institutional structure, there will be these accusations, these anxieties, these fears, these concerns. Before in 2013, when I did my research in India, 
there was no recognition whatsoever. Maybe one or two dance studios put on their ad, ads like, oh, we also teach breaking or, or hip hop or something like that. Um, but other than that, there was nothing. It was a, a truly a, a sort of a, a grassroots culture. And there weren't these fears, there weren't these, these concerns. Um, as soon as you bring in an institutional structure, um, people will be very, uh, very concerned and will have all these, you know, ideas about what that institutional structure entails. Yeah, yeah, I can add um, in, in Morocco, breaking is really like a grassroots culture. Um, there's not really a mediation. Um, it's not a teach in dance schools. There's not really an interest in it. Not really. Sometimes a little bit, but it's not the thing which you would do advertisement for. You would more do advertisement for hip hop or hip hop dance. And then you might teach breaking inside. But if you would do advertisement for breaking, probably nobody would sh show up in the dance school. Um, you have, because Morocco is a monarchy, everything is somehow organized in structures and controlled. So this is why you have break the, the breaking in the Federation since a few years already, because it needed to get inside a official structure to be able to have bigger events. So this is not uh, due to the, the breaking community, but this is due to the the system of the, the country, why it's in a federation. And this for me is the interesting point here, like that suddenly a federation is becoming important for the breakers to achieve something else. As before the federation was more something which were like delivering um, a breaking event once a year. Um, and they had to be in the federation just to be able to do this breaking event. And in the other aspects, the federation was more controlling the scene than helping the scene. And now there's a little bit of a twist, which is really interesting because the, um, those who are already like uh, good with the guy who's responsible for breaking in the Federation, who's also a former dancer, at least, um, are kind of positively thinking about the Federation. Those who are not in contact with them are kind of negatively thinking about it. There is a lot of also mistrust. Also, it's also about corruption, of course. Um, so it's... Um, the way how breaking is mediated in Morocco is totally different than we know it from other countries just because it's a monarchy and I'm also trying to understand the structures and why things are happening the way they are functioning because I'm just moved there two years ago and it's not easy to understand but I, I start to understand that the system there is working totally different than we are used to it and we cannot use our western perspectives uh, on this system and also not on the community, on the breaking community, also not on the challenges and everything. Um, but I can also say that uh, in general, when we see um, breaking, there is there are two institutions which offer practice possibilities in Casablanca. And Casablanca is like a three and a half million city. There is one institution which is offering practice spaces, like a practice space, safe space in Tanger. Tanger is also a big city, one in Agadir. Um, there is none in Rabat where I'm living. We are practicing in our living rooms on terraces. We are buying like P4C floor. We don't have a studio. Um, so the, the structure which is there for breaking is very, very low. And thus is also the mediation. And I feel that breaking is mediated when it's beneficial for an institution or for a structure or for an event. Um, or for commercial events, of course, dancers are booked to make shows, but then it's a mix between breaking and hip hop. It's more like a commercial show. So, um, yeah, I, I, I hope this answers your question a little bit. And I just try to give you like insight of what I'm trying to understand myself. Uh, yeah, there. no, I, I think it's, yeah. it's, a really, it's interesting to hear your reflections on structures and, you know, culturally specific structures that, in, in, you know, either provide or, or the social infrastructure that enable it or, you know, maybe limit it or it's, it exists outside of it, you know, and, and establishes its own social infrastructure. I, just, I only ask because in even just between where I'm located now in Bangkok and then across just, you know, in Japan, there are distinctly different outcomes from this, the, the role of community leaders who, have, who are l leveraging this relationship with the WDSF. Uh, one of which in Thailand is like, you know, throughout COVID, ballroom dancers were able to keep functioning 
to keep dancing, to keep their competitions going, to keep their membership fees going, breaking was not mentioned at all. They were not allowed to host training camps. They were not allowed to host classes as part of the local dance sport federation. Why is that? Why is it that this mediation of ballroom is so popular in this one particular region and not, you know, and these other disciplines which are falling under their purview now and not being embraced. Whereas in Japan, you know, th this sort of relationship between community leaders getting involved and, and, and parlaying with uh, local state government and using these, using these opportunities to do things like create safe or safe spaces for, for communities, one of which is um, uh, Mizunokuchi Station, which was originally, you know, one of the biggest and most important, uh, I guess, hip hop cult hip hop cultural spaces for you know Japan practice. Hub. Yeah, it's the Japan <laughs> Hub, um, which has been at the mercy of conservative citizenry, police, local government officials calling police in to vacate the area, even though all you know it's after hours and all people are doing are dancing there. That's now been officially recognized by the state government and the local city council as a a cultural i guess it's like got some some sense of cultural preservation um that's that's happened because of this new relationship that they've been able to establish and that's also led to newer opportunities to to sort of reflect on their own lack of social infrastructure for cultural communities like hip-hop communities in japan new things like youth centers are being talked about and you know so there are just all these interesting dynamics that i see in different cultures and different places so it's just interesting to hear how different things are in in india and in morocco as well i can bounce on that jason you know there's a lot of globalization there because i know those brothers in mizuno Kuchi personally because i've been there many times at least four times and that connection yeah. that they've had with the you know what I'm saying? I've had that connection with them, but also other Canadians like Tintin and Pieces have had that connection to build with Abidjan and build with Katsasan. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So then they saw how we were doing things in Canada and they're like, yo, we can really do it here in Japan and because of, you know, culturally the work ethic and the way they're connected and presenting themselves professionally, they're able to leverage those types of things. But it's, you know, working in tandem with people where there's a reciprocity and a mutual respect, you know, here in Mississauga, right beside Toronto, there's been a lot of that over the years. But at the same time, you know, realistically, um, you know, the lens is going to change from place to place. And I think the uniformity and the globalization of how we even look at ourselves is important, but it's also, you know, really hip hop is the, is the, is the mirror. It's the folk cultural mirror of human society. So the way people are going to be behaving locally in relation to what's happened traditionally and economically, you know what I'm saying, is going to be reflective in how people are seeing, you know, how they represent their break and how they're treating each other, you know, gender and otherwise, right? So that I think is one of the biggest challenges. The last thing I want to say, because I know so I can speak, you know, off the top of my head or whatever, but really, um, you know, the process of even how the IOC, um, DW, you know, WDSF, ex excuse me, I found it was mad convoluted. Like when I went into it, I felt like, you know, it was mad underground, like, like the wild, wild west. And, you know, if it wasn't for Mary and maybe a couple of other people, I would have been lost in the sauce. You know, I've had other people who have asked me, Frost, what do you do? What's going on here? I'm like some secret society, you know, we're trying to put this out forward. But I don't know if it's going to necessarily work like that. And another thing I'm seeing a problem with is uh, um, the, the boys club. There's a boys club that's starting now. You know what I'm saying? People are starting things and they're positioning themselves and posturing themselves as like the pinnacle of how things should be. Meanwhile, in my opinion, excuse my language, they're fucking just jumping on the bandwagon because like I said, there's other cats who've been doing this shit for a long, long, long time and have valid uh, experience to contribute to the table. But because people are finding opportunities to posture themselves because they think they're going to get the money and an opportunity and stuff. Again, it's the hip hop, man. It's the, you know, the bird eat bird because dogs don't eat each other. Birds do. You know what I'm saying? It's the same old thing. The capitalism structures um, uh, benefiting off of indigenous ways of knowing. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, it's so unique that people can't even see it. I can smell bullshit a mile away. So when I see guys that I look up to for a long time start behaving that way, you know, I'm like, oh, that's not cool. You know what I mean? Uh, okay, it's, it's going to be great for some, but not for everybody. You're just kind of shifting this thing around. You know, and I see some people leaving. Maybe my word is too much truth. But that's the facts. If you want to come hard on it, you know. No, that's just right, 
Oh, if you I understand what I'm saying, let me know. Maybe I'll, I'll oh, add sure. a provocative uh, kind of question because it's come up recently. And I, I guess because of the, where the conversation's gone, I just want to preface it by, you know, um, where I live in Canada, the Wendat people have been uh, governing the land since long before um, the settlers came and kind of had their ways of thinking about wealth and property. Um, and certainly the Wendat philosophers were putting out to the world that there are different ways of being in the world that aren't organized around money. And you just see that so clearly in the conversation, right? That once we introduce money and property and certain ideas about freedom that are very Western driven, um, here we are. But I think breaking has always held on to some of that oratory history of convince people with your persuasiveness. <laughs> so for us, that's why I always feel guilty cutting you off or cutting anyone off because it's the persuasiveness of the rhetoric that is actually that that gift that I think is carried breaking a lot of the way um, as well. So that's all, all that to preface to say that um, when we start talking about nation state, Jaspel and Freda, your work really brings this up for me, the thing about Morocco and India, when we think about what's happening with the Ukraine and then now the provocative question is around what's going on with the Russian uh, WDSF, right? Because uh, when we're in this this structure, whereas in breaking competitions, you don't represent your nation state. So you come and you you battle. If, if you can get somewhere, if you can get across a, bo uh, a national border with a visa and you go compete somewhere, you're not representing your nation. But now we have the question of um, athletes being excluded because say they're, they're Russian or being told by the Federation to not speak out um, about what's going on in the Ukraine. So I, I just wanted to raise that question around nation state and how, how it might be, how people are thinking about it. Emil, I know you, you spoke about it as well. I'm thinking about the, the global South, how that's it. Frida and Jasper, do you think that'll kind of factor into to what you're thinking about or Devorah or anyone has comments about what the, the representation of a nation state is going to do for exclusion and inclusion in the political minefield that introduces to the culture? I kind of give a short answer. I, I don't really, I cannot answer this political question, but what I can say is that um, since the Olympics are at stake, the Moroccan Federation is more interested to send Moroccan dancers to battle in international competitions outside of Morocco. So there are many dancers who are hoping, who are in the national team, that they will be able to take, get more experiences to travel. And they are also proud to represent the country because Morocco is also a very proud nationalist country. Mm. This, I, I, I don't think that the dancers are thinking of it in any political ways, but I just want to say that there are also chances for the dancers to, be, to represent a nation. Whereas if they don't do it, they they cannot just travel because they need visas and it's very difficult for them to get visas and to travel. Um, for some, it's impossible. Some are able to get visas. So this kind of representing a nation is giving possibilities to get visas, again, for the dancers to, to travel for battles for the Federation. But maybe also if the visa is long enough, they can travel for battles which they're, where they want to go. So it's... It's also linked together somehow. Yeah. But it's a very interesting point, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting. I, I don't want to like riff on this because I will speak too much about it. But what all I can say is in India at the moment, there's this heavy nationalization, this heavy drive towards being pride of your nation, uh, which is interestingly framed as a sort of a decolonial move. Um, which is not decolonial at all because it is super neoliberal, it is super like corporate investment and so on. Um, so what I've seen in the in the hip hop community and in the in the in the breaking community is that you know a lot of dancers, a lot of hip hop people in India have sort of turned towards this idea of being proud of of your nation, which to me as someone who's from Germany, I was always like, screw my nation, right? I was always anti-national, right? I would never go and wave a German flag, right? So there, there, was, there was this weird, strange, like uh, uh, kind of, I don't know, even know how to say it, uh, convergence, right? Between like nationalism and hip hop. Um, and I always thought of hip hop as being something anti-national. <laughs> it seems in India at the moment, there's a lot of people who, who are kind of, 
feeling pride in their nation and would also like to go and you know compete for their nation in the Olympics. Yeah, in, in the presentation I, I, I gave, I um, exposed the fact that a lot of times the South African um, national team is made up of people who can't afford it. And so out of like 10 people, nine people are white South Africans. And so it's not about the level of the, the artists, it's about who can afford to actually travel to the Olympics because the illusion that's created here is that there will be funds available <laughs> for traveling. And that's not the case. It's usually the the big sports like soccer and rugby and all the, you know, the, they get the funding, like the smaller sport you have to raise your own money. And so, um, and, and, and as um, the, in the case in, in, in India, they, they are 11 official languages in South Africa. So there's a huge like divide in the cultural community and perception of who is South African. Like I, how I look is not South African. Most people think I'm from Brazil, right? <laughs> and, um, and attached to that is also the um, like the 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 the, 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 the corporations that are involved here. And I can give you an example. When um, BC1 was held in South Africa, they called me to ask me if I knew of a black judge. And I was like, yo, what do you mean? And they're like, no, you know, not, not you, a black, like Mandela black judge. I was like, yo, there is nobody that's on that level to judge the competition. And they're like, let's move it from Cape Town to Johannesburg because that's the, you know, economic hub of the country. Um, let's have it in a old, old um, power station where all of the all of the coal dust fell onto the stage, and I had to insist that they clean it because uh, Lilo was unable to even breathe at that altitude, let alone inhale all of those dust particles. So again, it's big corporations that dictate what is happening and, and, and why I brought up the idea of like uh, um, industry, because those are industry deciding um, and, and people, there was one question about, is the Olympics much different from the BC one? You're talking about industry, not speaking about the culture, you know, you need to, you need to think about these things as separate entities. The culture actually set up a global a movement of dancers. The, the culture is the one that put this in, in place. It's the people in every country around the world that traveled by car, slept on, on someone's floor, uh, you know, ate whatever they could afford to get to a jam. Those are the people that set up this, this global network, you know, and we must try not to forget that because that's really where the power is. We need to decenter the circle. The circle has the power, not the dance in the middle. That's where the power lies. Super well said, man. Once again, you know, a lot of times it has to do with optics, you know. Everybody's on the optics because money makes the world go around, you know. And there's somebody who uh, who's out there who's not invested the way somebody is like us getting down, whether you're you know, academically studying your ass off or you're throwing down hard. Um, they're not in the same place, so they can't have possibly an empathy with what's going on, you know, at all. I think we've had an amazing discussion tonight. This has been one of the, the best sort of, you know, post talk discussions. And if anybody has anything final they want to share before we end the recording, you know, feel free to jump in, post questions to the panelists who are still here if they are. And if, if not, you know, feel free to reach out at any time. Um, I just want to apologize if I pissed anyone off. Um, I don't know why I'm apologizing, but I, I feel like that I have to because I'm, I'm, I believe I'm a considerate person. I know that I am, but really this is hip hop, you know, and it's raw and all unadulterated and that's just how it is. We come real with it, you know, and I appreciate everything that was said. Um, I respect everybody here. Really, I do. Um, I just, uh, some, somebody who likes the challenge, you know, and I, I'm very honest. So I'm going to straight up tell you how I feel, but I, I, my question is, do these types of discussions between persons of, you know, our um, caliber of thought and in-depth insight into our culture, do you all feel that this is beneficial? What's the next kind of steps after that? Um, and um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that and I'm done talking. Thanks for listening. Yo, Frost. Oh, uh, also like that kind of, because I kind of got inspired by the, 
everyone talking today because I, I, me and Jason had talked about next steps. So this isn't a real thing, but I just wanted to pitch it. I thought we'd been thinking about, you know, after we do the next couple months, where we're going to go. And I, this made me think, oh, where we should go next is like a move away from the Olympic conversation. Like we gave the Olympic conversation its airtime, but where, where we could go is somewhere different in terms of thinking about uh, what kind of like events do we want to see? What kind of things that, yeah, does this kind of like um, straight up intellectual form, not academic, but intellectual uh, conversations across the globe? How can we, you know, what's the next step for us? Yeah, yeah totally. having those conversations. So that was really good for me to think, yeah, okay, they, they've got airtime and we're giving it airtime for the space, but maybe there's a, a direction to kind of keep building, but in a different direction. Yeah. That's what I, I think yeah. that will actually influence um, everything else in the Olympics there afterwards. Because if our foundation is strong in our overstanding of what's going on, then we're going to be coming up with the correct modalities and approach and mentality to handle these types of situations because we're creating uh, more of a, a consensus that is mutually, um, you know, uh, founded on something that is looked at more in depth. You know, if I'm working on footwork and I only scratch the surface of it and I'm collaborating with some other people who have like a lot of experience, then we, we sit in a pot for a while together and start talking about other things in life you best believe that those stories of other things in life are going to impact the footwork on a greater level. And that's the type of knowledge I think we should be respecting and honoring because some of you who are still currently here who are listening, who you know, have PhDs and, and working really hard on that stuff, you have in, incredible insights into things collaboratively with some of us who are like myself, who are uh, fairly educated, but aren't on that level of academia, but still have in-depth understanding of the, the inner nuances of what we're doing. There has to be more of a, a deeper, respectful collaboration and, and, and honest insight about where we're going and what it is that we're even talking about, really, you know? So that's, again, sorry, but that's how I feel. Thanks a lot, everyone. Peace.